It's right at noon, so let's get started. I assume Commissioner Gifford will join us in here. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We have a fairly lengthy agenda, and so I'd like to get started right away in a joint workshop with HPTE. This is Floyd Hill update, and I'll turn this over to Paul Gisitis. All right, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. It's my pleasure to lead off this discussion on the I-70 Floyd Hill project. Um, the uh, slide you're looking at there is a picture of the bridges that we drive over today being constructed in 1959. And so those are the very same bridges we drive on today, except we've wrapped the columns in carbon fiber wrap and we've replaced the guardrail with concrete rail. We've repaired the expansion joints. Um, but now that bridge, the one in the near side there is um, considered in poor condition and eligible for bridge enterprise. So, um, you know, I think it's worth pointing out the population of Colorado in 1959 was 1 1.71 million. And um, here we are driving on those very same bridges today and our population is now 5.94 million. So it's, it's gone up quite a bit in that time. And that's why anybody who's traveled this stretch of road on a, on a warm summer day or up to the ski areas is sitting in traffic wondering what's going on. And that traffic is now extended onto US 6, onto the US 40 frontage road, and it's really created gridlock um, up on top of Floyd Hill and caused a bunch of problems. So um, I do wanna also say thank you to the I-70 collaborative effort and um, Steve Harrelson. Steve was the program engineer in the area and he helped build some really great relationships that we have uh, with all the local agencies in the corridor and um, especially Idaho Springs and Clear Creek County who really um, you know, face the brunt of this traffic every day and they've been working really well with us. We've built a lot of trust and that's gotten to us where we are today where um, we actually signed a tier one record of decision in 2011, which really sent, set up the framework for where, where we are. And since 2017, we've been working on this tier two um, environmental assessment for this particular Floyd Hill project. So making great progress with uh, preliminary design and moving forward. And before I turn it over to Neil, I just wanted to turn it over to Nick for a few opening comments. Nick? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I know we came to you guys back in November to talk a little bit more about this and the funding picture of this. This is more focused on um, where the region is going with the project going forward. I just want to let you guys know that we're still working on um, a in more in-depth traffic and revenue study on the Floyd Hill project. That should be done in the May, early June timeframe, and we'll have um, additional analysis for you in the June, July uh, for the transportation commission meetings. Um, but since we last spoke, you know, I think in, in November, we said our top limit, HPD's contribution limit was $50 million. Since then, we did a little bit more in-depth work and um, the range has gone up a little bit between 60 and 74 million as a net pledge, um, which means that um, we would be able, we would pay as opposed to a gross pledge, which we have on other, our other corridors where we pay debt service last um, without a CDOT backstop. Um, so if we had a CDOT backstop and we did a gross pledge, we'd probably go a little bit higher, but right now that range is between 60 and 74 million for the HPD contribution. I think as Neil will show later on slide 11 of the presentation, um, the, the project is looking for a $65 million contribution from the HPD. But more information from us to come, but I'm just gonna now hand it back to Paul to hand it to Neil. So, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, I think, towards the end. So, all right, thanks, Nick. And um, Neil, you're up. All right, well, uh, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, again, I'm my name is Neil Ogden, I'm with the uh, CDOT Region One and West Program, and I'm managing the, the Floyd Hill project. And uh, so, just a high level agenda what we're going to talk about here. I got, got a lot of content. Um, so we'll go relatively quickly, uh, but we'll talk project status, uh, delivery strategy, and how we've broken this into uh, three distinct packages, uh, the funding and cost for those distinct packages, and then the potential schedule and some next steps.
So as Paul mentioned, we've been working on uh, the Floyd Hill project, preliminary design and NEPA or the environmental piece of this project since, since about 2017. Uh, during, that, during that time, we've been working uh, with local stakeholders, general public uh, through the I-70 Mountain Corridor context sensitive solutions process. And so that's something where we've, whole, we've held over 20 stakeholder meetings, uh, two public form, formal public meetings, and then a variety of um, small group meetings just to collect input and, and to build on these two alternatives you see here uh, on the screen. So the two alternatives we looked at uh, were the Canyon Viaduct, which is the, the top right picture here, and then the tunnel alternative, uh, which is the bottom. And so, you know, through the analysis, uh, we're wrapping this up as we speak. And, and what has emerged is this Canyon Viaduct alternative is being recommended in the environmental assessment as the preferred alternative. So in terms of project status, as Paul mentioned, we've got our preliminary design uh, well underway. We've got our 20% uh, plus or minus done. And so that's enough for us to, to make the, to do the analysis and make the recommendation that, that you see above uh, for this Canyon Viaduct alternative. Um, we are planning on releasing our environmental assessment in the next couple months, so, so this spring. And then we do have uh, good cost estimates on this one. And so for all three packages, we are looking at this $700 million. So uh, obviously big project, uh, but this is all inclusive and includes escalation and all those kind of the program costs for a project like this. And like I mentioned before, you know, uh, we've been working with, with stakeholders and general public throughout the whole process and have had overwhelmingly positive uh, feedback and support uh, for the project. And last piece is just, uh, you know, tying to the next slide and how we're, or we're strategically looking at packaging this uh, so we can you know, take, take bites out of this elephant of a project. All right, so this, this slide summarizes the, the delivery strategy and how we're, how we're looking to package this and use some existing dollars to get some, some major improvements out on the street as soon as possible. You know, the key takeaways here is you know, no throwaway work. So we're building our package zero scope and, and building packages one and two off of that. Um, the package zero, and we'll go into these details in the, the, the next few slides, uh, but we have a total project cost of 110 million for that work. Uh, we're looking at some wildlife crossings, roundabouts, uh, some local transit improvements, which includes um, micro transit shut, micro transit shuttles, not micromobility, a little bit of clarification there, as well as um, major improvements to the west section of the project and, and the east section of the project as well. Then last two bullets here are just the, the subsequent packages. And, and again, those would just build off of our initial package zero with some of our existing uh, funding that, that could be available. All right, so this slide is just uh, jumping into the early improvement elements on our, our package zero scope. And so uh, a location map here where we've got some wildlife crossings actually uh, outside of the, the project limits, but uh, we've worked with the local stakeholders and subject matter experts to determine these, these optimal locations and, and really looking to get the biggest bang for our buck uh, with these two, two locations for the wildlife crossings. And then the other piece on here is, is the roundabouts and the operational improvements. And so those are within the project limits on top of Floyd Hill. And we'll go into more, more details on those in the next couple of slides. So this is a, a deeper dive into the, the wildlife crossing locations. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, strategic locations where we've identified high uh, vehicle and wildlife collisions. And so, you know, we're looking to reduce those, improve safety, and then improve that wildlife connectivity. So um, the first one here is the Empire Overpass. So this one is actually over US 40, but right north of I-70. And so this is something that's been at the top of CDOT's list, the top of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, wildlife list, 
and, and we're just excited to get this one moving and on the street. Next one here is the Genesee underpass and another uh, a high accident cluster in this location and, and a great opportunity to get um, an underpass at this location uh, where we've got some local land uses that are very um, supportive of, of this improvement in this area. So next piece is uh, the roundabouts. And so this is intersection improvements on the top of Floyd Hill. So this is an area where we, where we see a dehabilitating congestion during our peak travel times, where local community residents on the south side of the interstate here uh, are stuck in traffic for up to an hour. We have emergency response concerns and by implementing these, these roundabouts, we see some significant benefits immediately helping access and emergency response uh, through this local and, and interstate system at this location. And then second piece on this one is the, the transit and micro transit component. And we've got a, a couple of existing um, informal park and ride lots that we'd be looking to, to work with stakeholders to, to see if there are opportunities for uh, micro transit stops at these locations, as well as throughout the project to, to see where we can, we can get uh, some of these smaller shuttle vans on the corridor, uh, taking consolidating people into to vehicles and reducing those, those vehicle miles on I-70. So this slide is uh, wrapping the, the package zero scope elements. And so the west section is, is really the ultimate Floyd Hill project. And so this is something that we were able to sever and really make some, some full improvements through this section of the, the project and corridor. And so we're looking at uh, flattening some of the tightest curves on the corridor, uh, taking care of some of our rockfall issues here, uh, adding that third westbound lane through this section restoring Clear Creek, uh, where I-70 had impacted this when it was first built back in the, the 60s, and then doing some intersection improvements at Hidden Valley, uh, including some roundabouts and some, some acceleration and deceleration lanes through that. Next piece is, is the east section. And so this is where we are looking to reconstruct eastbound I-70 uh, really, really enabling for our package one work where we come in and, and do the westbound widening. Uh, but we also add a eastbound auxiliary lane up Floyd Hill uh, to help with our slow moving vehicles and, and uh, commercial vehicles to improve that operations and mobility uh, going up Floyd Hill. So next couple of slides are just uh, uh, wrapping, wrapping the rest of the project and talking about the, the package one and package two project elements. So package one comes through and uh, takes care of all of westbound I-70. So adds that additional capacity in the westbound direction from the top of Floyd Hill all the way through Veterans Memorial Tunnels. Um, it takes, our, uh, takes westbound I-70, puts it on the viaduct, uh, takes care of the two bridge enterprise eligible structures uh, that we've been talking about, the one at the bottom of Floyd Hill, and then there's one, uh, the off ramp from, from westbound I-70 to US-6 that we would take care of as well. Uh, we do uh, finish the interchange improvements uh, at Hidden Valley and then US-6, the westbound interchange improvements. And then we reconstruct the Greenway Trail from Hidden Valley to the US-6 interchange through this section. And then this is the package two project elements. And this is where uh, we are taking care of eastbound I-70. Uh, so we're, we're reconstructing eastbound I-70, putting that on the viaduct, uh, extending the frontage road where there does not exist one today from the Hidden Valley interchange to the US-6 interchange, and then uh, taking care of our eastbound ramps at the interchanges. So this slide is a summary of our project costs and funding. And so the big piece here is these are, again, all inclusive. And so, you know, these, this is everything on the pre-construction side from design, uh, some right-of-way, some utilities, some, some um, geotechnical work, 
and you can see these different phase costs on the left side of this top table. Then we have our construction management, which is what it, what it takes for CDOT to get out and build this thing. And then our construction costs on the, the bottom uh, row on the top table. And as you go from left to right across this table, you can see the summation of these costs by package and then the totals all the way on the right hand side of that table. Oh, back one, please. Uh, bottom table just, just hits on the funding and shows where these uh, funding contributions come into place and where they would be used. And so as you can see on this table, we've got the, the potential Senate Bill 267 funds um, funding package zero. And then we've got uh, the HPTE and Bridge Enterprise combined with 267 funds uh, completing the package one funding and then looking for the, the additional funding out for package two uh, as this thing uh, gets off the ground. So this is the, the last slide and just the potential schedule and next steps. And so, you know, looking for that list to be considered over the next couple months uh, for this project. Uh, our team is, you know, poised and ready to advance design uh, once, that, once that direction is provided. We talked about the environmental assessment being released in the next couple months. Uh, that'll be followed by a, a virtual public engagement event, you know, where CDOT's had some, some great success uh, during COVID, uh, getting that out and, and, and getting additional input uh, during that environmental process. And last couple of bullets here are just uh, final, as Nick, Nick mentioned, finalizing the Bridge Enterprise and HPTE contributions uh, through this year, and then looking to uh, potentially start construction um, on some of these early work packages as early as 22. So I know that was fast and furious, but definitely want to leave time for some, some questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, if you will put your name in the chat box, I'll start calling on you for questions. I'm sure we have plenty. Anyone? There we go. All right, I have Commissioner Stanton and then Director um, Bowes. Thanks, Chair Stewart and Neil. And I thought that was a really great brief and I appreciate all the effort you've done on community outreach. One question you mentioned, the 700 million would include cost escalations, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about potential risks? Because that's a pretty uh, interesting geologic area that you're going through. And also, um, is there any way if things don't look good economically for Colorado's economy and uh, we have minimal um, taxes coming in that anything can be cut or is this uh, the options you've shown us, the bare bones. Thank you. So, so, so great question. And, you know, Paul or others jump in as well. Uh, but we, we definitely um, are, have evaluated the risk and in our estimates are, are carrying some risk contingency, right? Uh, that, that said, we are also looking at alternative delivery. And, and so that's where we can look to um, contract renovations, minimizing that risk throughout project development. And to answer, I think the second part of your question, you know, given this phased approach, that's how we can, can, can divide move scope as appropriate based on available funding. Does that answer your question? Yes, and there was one other question on eastbound with the problem in early morning sun at the crest uh, will this project help alleviate some of the accidents, et cetera, that happened as sun comes up? And so I, I think that came up at, at the last meeting. And one of the things that we're doing to address that is to work with our emergency response teams to figure out where we can better stage folks and close the highway uh, during those events. Um, you know, we are improving the profile at the bottom of the hill, but going up the hill, given the topography, that's going to be very challenging uh, 
to, to move that sun. And so again, we're trying to work on the other side and, and you know, try to improve that response with, with those teams. Thanks, Neil. Sure. Thank you. Um, before I go to, to Director Bose, can I uh, have Director Liu chime in here, please? Thanks, Chair Stewart. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to touch on related to that really important question um, that Commissioner Stanton raised. I think two things, and this is responsive to the, the last dialogue we had on this topic, which I think raised some of the questions that have really enriched this current presentation. You know, the first is that the way these packages are designed, they have independent utility. So you know, the, the team has gone through a lot of effort to make sure that you know, packages zero through two, I, su I suppose you could otherwise call them one through three, um, you know, are, 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 are kind of batches of work that each need to happen. And it's, it's, not, it's not like, um, you know, the, there's the, the first tranche of work is throw away if it takes a while to do the second or the third. You know, they're really, they've like granulated this to discrete investments kind of but, but bundling in some ways a lot of small parts into one big project. Um, that also means that we have options in terms of the timing of procurement. You know, do we do, we do the first package as part of the uh, kind of uh, you know, part, part and parcel of the second one? You know, we could do a separate procurement for the first batch of work that's that smaller. And that, that's something we're seriously talking about is sort of hiving off those first investments that we would make this year doing those as just sort of a standalone package of work, which um, doesn't, doesn't kind of complicate it with the future uh, portions quite as much in contracting. So I think there's a lot of options because of how refined the, um, the sort of scope is now in terms of breaking the work into pieces that will make it much easier to scale up and down um, in, in a way that's very transparent. And I think one of the things that is gonna be really important with this project is being very clear about what's in different work packages, about what the budgets for each of those are, um, and you know, particularly responsive to some of the you know, questions that always come up when we do a big project, break, breaking it into kind of more manageably sized pieces and explaining exactly what you're getting incrementally uh, for the dollar on each one is gonna be something that's a, a continued focus as we move forward, which hopefully reflects in this presentation. Thank you, Director Liu. Um, I have the uh, Director Bowes and then uh, Commissioner Vasquez, please. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. Uh, I was also going to comment on the, the phasing uh, that Director Liu um, already covered. So I'll just move on to uh, voice strong support for use of these uh, 267 year $3 for this project. As Paul mentioned, this is a specific uh, highway improvement identified in the I-70 record of decision. It's also the number one top priority project for the I-70 coalition. Um, so I think this is an opportunity to put some of those Senate Bill $267 to work uh, very quickly. And it covers a lot of bases, Package Zero does. It improves safety, mobility. It also has multimodal components and very, very broad stakeholder support has already um, been done around this project. So thank you, uh, Neil, for the presentation and uh, Paul and Neil for your leadership on this project. Thanks, Margaret, for your input. I know you've been um, really involved in this project and appreciate your input. Um, if you, I might just ask um, Chief Engineer Harrelson to say what he put into the chat because it's re in reply to uh, Commissioner Stanton's question and then we'll go to Commissioner Vasquez. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, for those of you who don't drive this road a lot, the, the sun glare problem that uh, Commissioner Stanton referred to, right, you know, from like mid-December till probably early February when the sun comes up, it, it just is lined up right with the alignment of the highway. And for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes every morning on a clear day, it's a, um, you know, it gets right in people's eyes. And, and that time of year, you know, people have uh, slush and gunk on their windshield and, it, and it's caused some safety problems. So in response to that, um, you know, if it's a clear day, our, our maintenance crews just, just close the road for 15 or 20 minutes until the sun, sun gets high enough so that it won't cause that problem. So it's a very difficult problem to solve with uh, infrastructure techniques. And, you know, we closed the Floyd Hill and if somebody has to get down to Denver, they can take the canyon. Um, so that, that's what we do. Thanks very much. Commissioner Vasquez? Yeah, thanks. In addition to the safety and uh, 
increased capacity for traffic that this project delivers. I was also really pleased to see the attention to wildlife crossings and the stream restoration in package zero. So hats off to the comprehensive nature of the package zero. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right, I'll turn it back to you, Paul. Anything else? No, I, uh, I thank you all for listening and um, we'll get you more updates as the progress, um, the project progresses. And uh, this is gonna be an exciting project. That's great. And now I'll just turn it back over to uh, Chief Engineer Harrelson. He has something to tell us about procurement. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to talk about the, the procurement of these packages. I think, you know, we're, we're still, trying to, to get that um, figured out completely. But you know, one possibility is that we could do some early procurement on the package zero and then, and then move into um, some other procurement techniques for the later packages. Um, you know, maybe do a low bid for package zero and break up those elements because they're, they're kind of independent projects. And then when, when we get to the larger projects and packages one and two, um, go to the alternate um, delivery uh, protocols that Neil mentioned. All right. And uh, it's uh, Commissioner Brackey has a comment. Oh, I just was putting a note in the chat. I also appreciated the inclusion of the wildlife crossings in the project and also the part about the micro transit. So I'm sorry, my dog is whining in the background. <laughs> <laughs> This is, Thank you. This, this is Kathy. This is really an excellent project. That's such a such a bottleneck, and because it's such a bottleneck, it's also very important for the safety to get this. So it's a great project. I hope we can come through with the money and and get the whole project done because it's so necessary uh, for I seventy. Thank you. Thank you, and I hope you don't mind if you put things in the chat that I ask you to say them, and the reason is that. When we're recording this, um, they won't be reflected in the recording unless you uh, say it in, into the microphone. So um, thank you all for your comments. If there are no further comments on this, uh, thanks very much for the great presentation. We'll look forward to uh, seeing this move forward. And we'll go to the next item on our agenda, which is um, the right-of-way condemnation authorization with uh, Steve Harrelson. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, this uh, workshop is to address condemnation authority in accordance with uh, CRS 431208. Um, CDOT seeks condemnation authority for five separate ownerships, um, both on the uh, I-25 North. Um, I think four of them are on segment six and one's on segment seven, if I recall correctly. Uh, condemnation information has been provided to the commission. You have also been provided with description of the portion of the highway to be established, open, added to, or changed, description of the property to be acquired for the project, property address, the size of the larger parcel, proposed size of the acquisition, net purpose of the necessary parcels, and any other relevant uh, information. Um, there's a map showing the present and proposed boundaries of the highway project and valuation of the pro properties as determined by waiver valuation or an appraisal, including damages and or benefits for specific pieces of property needed for the project. CDOT has determined that the condemnation of the properties is in the public interest as they are needed for the projects listed in your packets. Are there any questions or concerns from the commission? Were you able to hear me? My microphone was away from my mouth. Yes, we have, we have heard you and okay. um, We'll take questions or comments from the commission. And uh, prior to that, I'd like to ask Jennifer, did you receive any uh, requests from the public to uh, give us a comment on this condemnation? No, I have not. Okay, thank you. So questions and comments are appropriate at this time. All right, I, I'll go through each, uh, each acquisition right now and hopefully Perfect. you'll hear me better with my microphone. Um, so project number one is on I-25 North between 
State Highway 402 and uh, State Highway 14. It's immediately south of the Prospect um, Street interchange on I-25 and Fort Collins. Um, the property is owned by the Colorado State University Research Foundation and the project purpose is to improve safety and maintain and improve connectivity for the community. Next slide. So we've previously acquired some parcels that are shown in green from the same owner and we're uh, attempting to acquire those parcels um, shown in red on the map. Next slide. Um, within, so there's some temporary easements, some, some uh, right of way that we're buying in fee and, and also a, a utility easement that is owned by the city of Greeley for a water line. Next slide. And there's also a, a permanent uh, Fort Collins right of way easement that goes through this parcel that, that you see there that uh, would remain. Next slide. So CDOT prepared an appraisal um, February 11th for 387,000. Uh, the owners came back with an appraisal of about a million dollars. We made an offer of 387. Uh, thousand. We've completed two prior acquisitions from this owner in neighboring areas and the utility easements within our acquisition areas would be deeded to City of Greedley. Um, the counter offer is no counter offer has been received. Landowner not open to possession and use agreement. Um, condemnation is required due to immediate construction needs. Um, I will add that it, it's as of the last day or so, it sounds like we've got a, a memorandum of understanding. It's, it's not quite been finalized yet, but we think um, it, it soon will be. So we want to go ahead with the condemnation um, authorization, but uh, we think there's a pretty good chance that it won't be needed, that we'll, we'll reach a settlement. It looks like uh, Commissioner Hickey has a question. Hi, I am going to plead ignorance about these. And so I'm gonna ask, do you have an estimation of why the difference in appraisal figures? And I don't wanna impede on any of our negotiating you know, leverage. So I'm just gonna be naive and ask that question. Um, I, in my con and someone from the right of way can, can the right of way unit can chime in. My understanding is that um, you know, historically we appraise on existing use and um, this, these appraisals um, can get steered into the highest and best use. Um, and there's always a, a bit of disagreement is the existing use, the highest and best use and what is it worth? So that's, that's the difference. Thank you very much, Engineer Harrelson. All right, we can go to the next ownership. Um, so the, the next ownership is on um, segment six. It's a little bit further south. It's there at Johnstown um, between uh, at the interchange of Highway 60. And I think it's uh, just north of uh, Highway 56 uh, by Campion and, and Bertha in that area. Next slide. So th this is uh, some temporary and permanent easements and then also a right of way in fee um, north of County Road 46. Um, it's adjacent to a, um, uh, an irrigated hay field, I think, um, just south of the Great Western Railway. It's owned by RMSJ LLC. Next slide. Um, CDOT made an appraisal of $8,200 in December made an initial offer of that amount. Um, the owner countered with 63,000 and we um, uh, revised our offer to 33,000. Um, we gave the notice of interest to the uh, landowner last October. They have not um, obtained their own appraisal. Um, they, the amounts offered are for acquisition only. If we have to move that center pivot uh, irrigation system, that would be through the relocation program. Next slide. So there, there's a picture of the, the irrigation and, and there's a, uh, you know, the outermost uh, pivot arm um, 
is, is very close to our acquisition area. So um, we think we can work around that through irrigation season, but um, we're, we're keeping our options open in terms of the relocation. Next slide. So this is the next acquisition. It's, it's in the same project. Um, this is uh, some permanent easements and right of way uh, takes to be to come from uh, a property owner known as St. Paul Property Holdings LLC. Um, again, it's to uh, it's it's just north of Weld County Road 48. Um, you may remember this site. I think a month or two ago we we did an action on the the parcel just to the south, that, that little cul-de-sac and, and commercial building. So it's in that same neck, neck of the woods. Next slide. Um, CDOT uh, made an initial appraisal of 343,000, an initial offer of that amount in January. Um, they countered at 769, came up with an appraisal of 375. They lowered their counter offer to 550. CDOT made the last written offer in February 26 of 420,000. Um, the uh, owner has co some conceptual designs for development and believes acquisitions will reduce their buildable footprint and therefore um, impact their earning potential. Again, that's, that's similar to what we were talking about a moment ago, the, the highest and best use. We, our position is that we, we can't compare compensate for loss of potential of the business because you know that it's not a it, it's not the current use of the land so that's long been our policy um, we are uh, this is very similar to the CSU research foundation parcel it sounds like we are um, getting close to settling this it's not completely settled um, but but we are confident that it will be but we still want to um, move forward with the condemnation authorization in case that settlement falls through Next slide. Um, again, uh, some more parcels under a different ownership in the same um, little development just north of Weld County Road 48. Uh, it's owned by I-25 Gateway Center LLC. Um, some permanent easements and I think one temporary easement and then some also some right-of-way parcels in fee um, that you can see in the picture. Next slide. Uh, we appraised it at 573 in early February, made an additional offer of 573,000, um, set the owner a uh, notice of interest in October 2019. The landowner has not provided a completed appraisal and the landowner's attorney has stated early on that they do not intend to negotiate until court proceedings. So our hand is being forced. Next slide. And this is uh, the final ownership. It is also in the same development. If, if, you're, if you're looking, the, uh, the parcels have all been in the same little strip um, just north of Weld County Road 48. These are owned by the uh, Gateway Center Owners Association. Again, it's a, a permanent easement, a temporary easement, and also a, a right of way and fee. Um, right there along the interstate, just north of the parcels we just talked about. Next slide. Uh, CDOT sent an, had an appraisal done in January of $49,150, an initial offer of that amount. We sent a notice of interest in October. Landowner has not provided a complete appraisal um, and they have stated early on that they do not attend to negotiate until court proceedings, again, forcing our hand. And I think that's it. Steve, this is Kathy. Is is that getting us anywhere near uh, the ends of, of trying to get those right of taken care of through that area? Um, not, even, not even close, huh? I, I, I think it's a, it's a Sisyphean task. It's it just every month it seems like we have a few of them. I, I know uh, the the crew up there has been working really hard and uh, and trying to get it done, but uh, you know we we have to follow the the uniform act to make sure we do it. Uh, in a fair and fair and righteous way. Yeah. Steve, uh, I don't know why I haven't asked this before, but on a project like this, when we end up buying property, 
how does that get rolled into the cost? Is that um, is that estimated up front or is it just an addendum to the cost of these projects? How do we allocate the cost so, of this? So when we set up a project, we, we put in a, a line item for, for right-of-way acquisition and we, and we do our best to, uh, to quantify what those costs are. And then as we go through the design process, um, you know, we look at, you know, what, what we think the, per square foot cost of the right of way is. And sometimes it pays to build a, a retaining wall so that we don't have to impact as much right of way. And it, it just kind of depends. So we, mm -hmm. we have a budget set up for it. And, and just like it's not tied to the construction contract, but it's tied to the, um, to the project budget, just kind of like design and um, utilities, et cetera. Thank you. All right, if there are no further comments, um, I guess we'll move on. Are you finished? Uh, well, I, I think we're supposed to ask, is anyone from the public here to speak? Is there anyone from the public here to speak, Jennifer? Uh, I have not received a request for anybody, no. Okay. <coughs> then I Thank think you. we'll chat about it tomorrow then. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. We'll go to the next uh, agenda item, which is the budget workshop FY22 workshop FY21 amendment. Good afternoon. Um, we're back this month to finalize the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, I'm going to ask Bethany Nicholas uh, to walk you through uh, final changes to the budget following our workshop last month. Um, you'll be asked tomorrow uh, to approve the final budget at your, your uh, regular meeting. Uh, which will then submit to the Office of State Planning and Budget ahead of an April uh, deadline. Uh, in today's workshop, we'll, we'll cover the final actions we uh, uh, are taking to balance the budget, and we'll also review some amendments to the current fiscal year 21 budget uh, that are part of our overall strategy to, to balance in fiscal year 22. Um, so with that, Bethany, if you are ready, I will hand it over to you to walk us through the presentation. Yeah, sounds good. Um, thank you, Jeff, and thanks, Jennifer. Um, we can actually go ahead and advance. So I think, yeah, perfect. Um, Jeff kind of spoke to the agenda a little bit there. So just starting off, um, you know, um, we've kind of been bringing this to you every month, so this should look familiar. Just as an overview, uh, this slide shows the one sheet revenue allocation plan. So at this point, um, we've fully balance the budget. So we've allocated funds based on the projected revenues. Inflexible revenues are automatically adjusted. Um, in, uh, flexible revenues are based on prior allocations. Asset management and maintenance are based on those asset management planning totals. Um, and just as a side note, you can find this sheet as well as the entire budget plan on our website. Uh, the link is in your packet. Um, so um, actually, if you want to stay on that slide for just one more minute, you can see in orange at the bottom one new item since we presented uh, last month. So the only things that have changed in the budget at this point uh, from between last month and this month are the HPTE budget allocations and some final balancing actions that we incorporated. And then I'll go over those in more detail um, in a few slides. Thanks. Great. Um, so just... Uh, kind of overview sources of revenue. This graph depicts at a high level, you know, what we're forecasting for FY22. So we're primarily funded with federal dollars, um, you know, about 642 million followed by state highway fund of about 547. Uh, then of course we have an anticipated issuance for Senate bill 267 of 500 million. And then the remaining about 210 million comes from revenues uh, from the enterprises and, and various other programs. Uh, next slide. And so here's the other side of that equation, which is the uses of revenue. And you'll notice this month that we're showing amounts on these two slides that um, are equal, that it, they balance at 1.9 billion. Um, so on the uses side of the equation, um, we of course have the majority of funds going to capital construction at 1.1 billion. Uh, 358 million for maintenance and operations, 224 million to sub allocated programs. And then the remaining about 239 million going to things like administration, agency operations, multimodal services, and then other programs, including debt service. So there's just kind of an overview of what our budget is looking like for FY22. 
Now on to um, a little more of the mechanics and the balancing piece of this. So um, since last month, we updated that HPTE revenue forecast and the budget, including the fee for service, and we completed some other final balancing actions. And that actually brought our deficit down from the 8.4 million we talked through last month to now only 2.8 million. So that was actually some kind of late breaking good news for us, meaning that to balance, we do not now need to make any of those program reductions we discussed last month. Um, of course, with the current revenue situation being somewhat volatile, not knowing what the future will bring, we're gonna keep a close eye on revenues. Uh, we update our forecast quarterly and monitor to see if we need to make any amendments. And we can do that as we're in flight with the budget next year. Um, and we're actually going to be providing our next quarterly revenue update next month. So, um, you know, we have that, that option. But for now, we're looking at just a $2.8 million gap that we still need to uh, close. So um, I don't know if you recall from last month, but we do have about 4.2 million remaining of unallocated STBG funds. So at this point, we can pull from those funds and fully balance the budget. So that's some pretty uh, great news actually. Uh, next slide. So these next two slides kind of get into the finer details of the mechanics behind how we're gonna execute ba the balancing actions that we've been talking to you about over the past few months. Um, so just bear with me for these two slides. Um, it, it's a little complicated, but I'll try and walk you through it. So um, it's actually gonna take a few different budget transfers for us to be able to make all the things happen so that we can get our FY22 budget in balance. Um, so these slides actually speak to an FY21 budget amendment that we'll need in the current year so that we're set up correctly for the beginning of FY22. May sound a little odd, but basically in order to balance, we're looking to set aside current year revenue. So, um, you know, we're projecting a shortfall next year and in taking the conservative approach, what we're wanting to do is set aside 21 funds. And that will put us in a good position to be able to weather what, what when we're anticipating will come. So. Um, and then, like I mentioned, of course, as we get into next year, we do have the ability to amend our budget if things turn out differently economically than we're currently projecting. Uh, but given the uncertainty, we're thinking this is the most prudent course. So as we discussed with you previously, we've been holding aside 27 million in program reserve for a maintenance and contingency reserve. So rather than funding those with new FY22 dollars, we held those amounts aside in the program reserve. Um, so those funds are in the reserve in the current year in FY21. And then we're also talking about taking 2.8 million of the remaining um, unallocated STBG that we have in this current year as well. So bottom line, for us to be able to take these current year dollars and shift them into the FY22 budget, we're requesting a 21 budget amendment. This amendment would go ahead and move those funds now from program reserve to each of those lines and then we will be ready to roll forward that budget into FY22 to cover those lines where we have them under allocated in FY22. Um, so you can see the first two bullets speak to shifting 12 million to maintenance reserve and then 15 million to contingency reserve. And then that final bullet is to shift the S2BG funds. And um, so we're actually gonna be shifting that into the debt service line. And we're effectively using that line as a kind of clearinghouse because it's one of the few lines we have available that doesn't necessarily support a specific program where we'd have to impact program staff with any of these kind of budget actions. So we, we wanted to find a place where we could do this mechanically and not have any impact on operations. Um, so with that, I think I might go to the next slide because there's a table that maybe can, I can provide a little more explanation and hopefully make clear what we're talking about. Um, so here it's kind of laid out in the table and you can see that we've set aside funds in FY21 that will then shift into 22. So for example, with debt service, we've bu only budgeted 9.6 million in FY22, but what we truly need to cover our obligations is 12.4 million. So that's why we have those S2BG funds there. So I know it's a little bit complicated and technical, but hopefully that makes sense. And I'll actually pause there to see if you had any questions. Um, and then I actually just have one slide after this is to share with you on timeline and next steps. Okay, anyone have any questions? Thanks, Bethany, for this. This is uh, pretty, pretty thorough and some good news as well. Anyone in the commission to uh, ask uh, questions uh, uh, at this point? Commissioner Adams, are you wanting to speak? Yes, please. 
Please do. Uh, uh, Bethany, and uh, what what is the economic scenario in the state that you guys uh, at least consider that would be the positive that would make this not as necessary in terms of the movement? Uh, what, what does that look like? What, ha what would have to happen? You know, I think for us, forecasting revenue a lot hinges on kind of the, you know, what's happening with the pandemic and what's happening with vehicle miles traveled. So it's pretty difficult to project um, kind of the course of the pandemic and vehicle miles traveled at this point, not knowing um, how movement is going to change. And even after the pandemic, if there's a new normal. So um, it's pretty difficult to, to predict. And I think we've been kind of taking a concert, conservative approach to that. So, I mean, upside obviously um, is that things as quickly as possible return to a sort of pre-pandemic state, but um, you know, so more, I think that- more, So more travel, more motor fuel tax revenues, uh, more, uh, more back to normal sooner makes this the, the inflow of dollars a little bit better and not as necessary for us to use reserves. Yeah, it really does hinge on vehicle miles traveled for this. So that's kind of what we look to. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. All right, do you want to continue then, Bethany? It doesn't look like there's any sure. other questions, yeah. Yeah, I just have one last slide just to wrap up and let you know uh, what's next. So we'll be asking tomorrow, um, you know, if if uh, if we can get a, a vote on a resolution for the FY21 budget amendment that will help us balance 22 and then um, to adopt the final FY22 budget allocation plan. Um, and then that will put us in line to submit everything to uh, OSPB and the legislature on the 15th of April. And that's it. Any, any final questions? I don't see any. I, I just want to thank um, you and Jeff for um, putting the link in there that shows the final budget allocation plan and all the, um, all the sub um, pieces to that, all the uh, appendices to that. And um, I often get questions that I can't answer, uh, but it looks like that document um, is uh, fairly accessible to everyone and certainly answers lots of questions. So thanks for putting that link in there with our, with our packet um, this month as well. Uh, it looks like we have a uh, comment from Commissioner B and then one from Commissioner Hickey. Yeah, um, as the presentation, I support what's all in there. Just a, a question on um, I think we've pretty well held our, our line for the maintenance dollars and all the, the main programs. Is there any projections on how we're going to be looking with meeting our uh, surface treatment um, goals in policy directive 14 um, in the years to come? Um, and have, has there been any analysis done on that or as we move into the next, next budget cycle, making sure that we're meeting trying to meet the goals of our policy directive 14, I guess is kind of my question. Primarily for the upcoming budgets, uh, this one is you know, pretty well cut and dried where we're at now, but just the impacts and making sure that with the reports that came out that show Colorado so low on our, our highway conditions, especially the rural roads and trying to figure out how to move the needle on improving our preventive maintenance so we don't have some of the higher cost overlays and the investments we made with the 267 and things, making sure we're getting chip seals and things on those in the years to come. So we're not having to try to redo those. Um, just as I've driven some on like Highway 86, I drove just a few weeks ago and some of the overlays that were done on there were thinner lays and are starting to already crack within three years or so and really need to be getting that chip seals back on there to try to preserve what we've invested in over the last several years. So just kind of, if you've done any analysis on that and how we can look at that into the next budget cycle. 
Yeah, and I, I can give a little bit of a general answer, and then I think Rebecca can offer um, some more specifics from the asset management perspective. Um, you know, I think what I'd, I'd start out by saying is that sort of our, our base levels of funding, so we're talking about our ongoing state and federal revenues, not, you know, your 267, your Senate Bill 1 infusions, but our base level of revenues um, are generally insufficient to hit all of our PD-14 goals simultaneously, right? So we have mobility goals, we have asset management goals, um, we, our base level of funding doesn't get us there across the board. And even I'd say within asset management, it doesn't get us there on all of our assets at the same time. Um, that being said, the last few years, I think we've made a lot of progress uh, against those PD-14 goals uh, because we've been able to supplement our base revenues uh, with additional 267 and Senate Bill 1 funds. Um, you know, a great example being the, the mon funds we're being able to put in through the Rural Pavement Program. And then I think Rebecca can can uh, can follow me up with uh, a, a, a little more specifics about uh, performance objectives with respect to surface treatment specifically. Thanks, Jeff, and um, thanks for the question, Commissioner. Um, I really appreciate the the look back to PD fourteen. Uh, is that it's a, a pretty important document we need to continue to revisit. So thank you for the question. Um, you know, Jeff said it well. I'll, I'll just add that. The, the delta we're looking at to really meet, uh, fully meet our performance targets for pavement, uh, MLOS, um, also bridges across the assets, they're very large numbers, you know, anywhere from two to 300 million a year, um, which is why what we've been able to do through Senate Bill 267 and that um, huge influx of dollars we've been sending to rural pavement um, in particular really helps. Um, but we would need to see kind of sustained levels at, um, at that amount over several years. Um, however, we're, you know, I think we're doing um, a very good job working with the dollars we do have in our base budget and then folding in new revenues when we can and continually tracking our performance against uh, those targets and, and certainly holding the line on um, also the, the national performance targets that the FHWA makes us accountable to as well. Okay, thank you. Um, just like to continue that conversation into the next buzz budget cycle as we start it, as we close this one out for the approval. So thank you. Thanks for that question. Commissioner uh, Hickey. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. I have sort of a random question to respond to some of the questions we have received, at least I have, and I think others have over the last number of weeks about choice of paving uh, materials. Responding to Commissioner Beattie's question a little bit, Will there be some time in the future when we can talk about the choice of materials? I don't think that's within our purview, but I wanted to be informed a little more about that. The concrete versus asphalt issue I've been asked about a couple of times recently and, and others have too. So I don't wanna raise it now because it's out of order. And again, I know it's not my purview, but want to be more informed about those choices, thanks. Thank you, Chief uh, Engineer. Um, yes, in, in terms of selecting pavement, um, we, we go through um, what is called a life cycle cost analysis to decide whether it should be concrete or, or asphalt. And we, we balance the, the immediate uh, upfront cost, um, ag again, with, with the uh, present value of the expected maintenance throughout the life of the, of the pavement. Um, in general, um, concrete lasts a, a bit longer, um, and but it also historically, anyway, has been more expensive. Sometimes, when commodity prices um, behave unpredictably, those those costs can flip. So we, um, you know, and also interest rates flip that uh, contribute to how we do those uh, project selections. So um, I think we can get Craig Whedon scheduled to, uh, to give us a great uh, summary of how we make those evaluations, but uh, that 30 seconds is in general what we do. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
And Jennifer has mentioned that Commissioner Tebow has joined us now, so let that record reflect that. Any other questions before we go to the next agenda item? Thanks, Jeff and Bethany, for a great presentation. The next agenda item is uh, SB 267 Year 3 Project Options. Rebecca? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I will give Jennifer a second here to pull up the slides, but um, just to note that I have Marissa Gahan here today on my team to help with this presentation, as well as Sharon Terranova uh, on the uh, transit projects as part of the Division of Transit and Rail. Uh, so excited for this conversation today um, because we are in a good position with, with looking like a, a year three of Senate Bill 267 is coming soon. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So as a reminder, last month, um, we did a, a recap of, of uh, you know, where we've, uh, how we've advanced over the last couple of years with the funding we received, what projects have been funded, where that left us from an equity standpoint and sort of just meeting our overall goals um, specific to the 10-year plan. So today we just sort of pick up where we left off. Um, in particular, we'll, we'll take you through staff's recommenda recommendation on which projects to fund with Senate Bill 267 Year 3. And notably, uh, for the first time, I think, in, at least in, in my time with CDOT, we are bringing you those projects together um, based on corridors. Uh, so this is, is somewhat of a, a change in um, approach and philosophy. Often we bring you the highway pro projects as a set and then we pivot and talk about transit. But really, as we work harder to think of our system as a system and as our solutions as in being inclusive of what we can do on the highway infrastructure side and the transit side, we thought it might be helpful to bring to you uh, those projects together as a set. So as a result, you'll see some bouncing back and forth between um, transit and the RTDs. We'll talk about the highway projects. I'd be curious for your feedback if, if that's a kind of a helpful change or a confusing one, but I, I can tell you from the staff perspective, it, it has been um, illuminating to see the investments we're making, whether they be highway or transit on each corridor. So we'll cover that. Um, and then of course, talk about regional equity. It's been um, key for, for CDOT all along and just some um, quick discussion of next steps mostly in terms of sort of our expected uh, timing for the third tranche issuance. Uh, so the, the framework here is we only are, are bringing forward to you one scenario today. Um, and that is, that is largely because the, we don't quite know how much money we're going to receive, mostly because of where premium comes in at. So after a lot of discussions internally, we felt like $500 million for the highway highway side of this, there's additional funding for transit, 10%. But a 500 mile, million scenario was really a good estimate of where we expect things to land. Um, and that a lot of work in, in sort of uh, developing projects lists for another 10 million, 25 million below or above um, probably wouldn't be worthwhile till we really knew the amount. So I think we feel pretty strongly 500 million gives you a a very good sense of what we could fund and a good list of projects. If that dollar amount comes in higher or lower, we'll certainly be back um, with other options, but this is our, our best uh, sort of forecast at this point. If you go to the next slide, yep, here's the, the equity, where we are with equity. Um, so I'll, I'll point you, so we've got essentially four tables here. The, the first one on the left, is our four-year equity target. This is where we wanted to make sure all the regions across the state ended up after we received four full issuances of the Senate Bill 267 dollars. Uh, the second table there is where we were in equity through year two. And as you recall, we got a little out of equity, um, partly driven by um, needing to move the I-25 North project forward in region four. Year three, uh, that year three request, that is the amount of money we're proposing to allocate to each region based on trying to achieve that four-year equity target. 
And then that final table there shows you where we are right now with those numbers if you agree to these allocations. The good news here is, is that with this third issuance, we are really within kind of striking distance of achieving those equity targets, um, which is great. That, that allows us um, to really make full use of the year four dollars across the state and make sure that for that final year of this funding, we're really able to achieve the rest of the projects and, and get money flowing across the state. Um, and the next slide we'll, we'll have uh, Sharon talk you through how this stands on the transit side. Sharon, are you on? I am, hi, can you see me and hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Yeah, so, so it's just as Rebecca said on the highway side, uh, it's the same chart here, but with our, our transit projects included. And uh, if you focus on the uh, original four-year equity targets on the left-hand side, and then, and then look how close we're getting on the year three on the right-hand column, I, I think this really sets us up well for meeting our original equity uh, targets uh, that we established from the beginning. So we're, we're tracking pretty well on this. Okay, I will um, go ahead and pivot us in then to giving you an overview of the proposed projects. And to do that, I think it's probably most valuable for you to, to hear directly from the RTDs as well as Sharon, as they are, are living and breathing these projects. Um, Chair, if we get bogged down and it's been too long, um, please let us know. We'll, um, I think everyone's committed to trying to go through these relatively quickly, um, but I'm, I'm sensitive that there's a lot of projects here and don't wanna eat up too much time. This is the interesting stuff for all of us who <laughs> represent these, these areas. So uh, yeah, thank you. We'll keep an eye on it. Okay, us too. <laughs> uh, Paul Josidas, are you, are you on? Ah, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, well, I'll go Madam through Chair. these pretty quickly. Uh, we talked a bunch about I-70 West Floyd Hill Package Zero, and that's that $135 million that we're um, hoping to get here in year three, get going with construction um, in uh, calendar year 2022. Then we have the I-70 corridor West Metro bridges, and that's the Ward Road Bridge. So this is um, one in a series of 17 bridges that we're replacing or, and need to replace along the I-70 corridor from about the Morrison exit to about Pecos. Um, and so we already have I-70 32nd planned, I-70 Harlan funded, and now this Ward Road Bridge. And that'll take care of um, our worst bridges out of those 17. Um, then we're contributing towards a project with Idaho Springs, 4.1 million to build a mobility hub in Idaho Springs. You know, we talked a little bit about, about microtransit in the I-70 corridor, and this would be an integral piece of that. Uh, next down, we've got the Lone Tree Mobility Hub. So uh, well underway talking to Lone Tree and determining what a good solution would be for a mobility hub at that location. Then we've got the I-25 and State Highway 7 Interchange Mobility Hub. Uh, once again, another uh, likely a park and ride with bus slip ramps for bus staying, something like that. Um, and then we're working with Castle Rock on another mobility hub, looking at different locations down there for uh, where we could place that. And then finally on this page, Interstate 270, that's our other big project in region one. So that 30 million is just for advanced right away environmental and design phase for that project. Sharon, did you wanna add anything on the mobility hubs? Sure, uh, one of the things that you'll see here on this slide is, oops, sorry, um, is the bus tank fleet purchases. So as we're adding new mobility hubs and new transit stations, it's, it's obvious that we need to add additional fleet to support these uh, new facilities. So um, that's what we're doing on uh, in region one and also in region four. So uh, the funding here is for an additional uh, five buses um, for these projects in this corridor. A total of, of 12 uh, will be uh, purchased for our I-25 corridor over the four year period, I should say. 
And we're also adding a Bustang heavy maintenance facility. We're hoping to uh, team with region one and just as we did with region two uh, down at Bijou street in Colorado Springs, we're looking for a place in Denver for a heavy maintenance facility for the Bustang equipment and storage. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stanton has a question for Sharon. Sharon, thank you for the brief. Uh, when you mentioned the Bustang and the new equipment in the future, are you looking at any kind of uh, electric buses or vans? Uh, I think that's that's certainly the goal, but r right now, uh, in order to have these uh, come online quickly for these facilities, we'll, we'll probably go with the traditional vehicles uh, on the I-25 corridor. And as uh, Paul said, for the microtransit on the I-70 corridor, I think we would begin looking at the smaller vehicles. But right now, I uh, if I heard Mike uh, Timlin correctly, we don't have an option for electric vehicles with this round of purchasing, but certainly we can shift at any time. Um, we just need to make sure that we have the, the right funding and the right uh, maintenance uh, equipment and uh, driver skills to operate different vehicles. Thank you, Sharon. And also uh, Paul mentioned multimodal facilities at Lone Tree and other places. Is there any options in there to put EV charging and stuff like that in, or would that be future costing? Uh, wherever we build parking, Commissioner Stanton, we are as part of the, uh, to address the executive order, we are including 5% of the parking spaces. We'll have EV chargers installed and ready on day one, and then another 20% will be pre-wired. Um, at Lone Tree, we're probably going with a no parking option there, staying with what the city wants. And so we would not be including EV charging there as we wouldn't be including parking facilities. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. So that uh, that solicited quite a few comments and we're gonna go to Kate Kelly to follow Commissioner Stanton, then Commissioner Hickey, Vasquez and Adams. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick comment on the electric buses. Um, yes, there are electric buses on the market. Um, I think the, the issue with using them for Bustang is Bustang is kind of by definition a very long inter-regional route. Yeah. Um, and so um, there really isn't the battery and range capacity in those vehicles that we need versus a bus that would run on more kind of a, a shorter city route. Um, so that it is on our radar. We're expecting to do um, some studies to understand when the technology will match our drive and duty cycle for those vehicles. Um, we're trying to do as much pre-planning as we can, um, but there just really isn't a vehicle that can do really long back-to-back -back routes right now. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. And Commissioner Vasquez says Kay just answered her question. We'll go to Commissioner Hickey and then Mr. Adams. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate Commissioner Stanton's question and that response. I just wanted to throw out that I've ridden the Mustang a lot, and I've seen others do so from Colorado Springs to Denver, and just wanted to say, I can't say enough, this is a life-changing um, transportation option for many people. I've seen people who could not get to Denver, certainly not safely, and who need it. You can tell they're going to the uh, medical facilities or to a job. I can recall a gentleman traveling to a job which provided a job for a disabled person that really wasn't available here. So I can't say enough how great this program has been for those of us who commute to Denver and need to do so safely and many others who have no other option. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, um, for that comment and also your personal experience riding the bus day. Uh, that's great to hear. Um, Commissioner Adams. Uh, actually, uh, Chair, I think uh, Kay answered my question as well. All right. Well, she's Madam, uh, Chair. Madam Chair, Bill Tebow. And it's Bill Tebow. Yes, Commissioner right. Tebow. Sorry. Um, and thank you all for being uh, patient with my schedule today. Um, could we go back to the previous slide? Because I want to focus a little bit on the highway. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to um, 
you know, set my mind straight on the fact that the 267 money is um, really one component of our total package. If you remember, the package was in the area of 1.6, 1.8 billion dollars. Um, the question, of course, is what to add back in view of the cuts that were occurring because of the pandemic uh, about a year ago. And um, one of the things that um, that I wanted us to think about and that I've been thinking about is um, as we consider these projects, uh, were there other projects that perhaps weren't in the one through three or one through four years that may have been in the outer years, four through 10 or five through 10, that maybe have come in the last year to um, some degree of importance that they should be considered, um, you know, at this juncture in terms of an add back to our total package. Um, what, what is encouraging for me to see is that there's a lot of, uh, for example, on this chart, uh, pipeline five through 10 for um, pre-construction, whether it's uh, transit or whether it has to do with um, with highways, because to me that shows that we're thinking ahead in terms of getting these so-called shovel-ready projects on the table for when, if and when, other monies come in through the General Assembly or through the federal government. So I'm just interested in during the presentation if um, if there was any discussion about uh, later year projects, for example, that maybe were were thought about advancing. Uh, to our to our current um, tranche of Senate Bill 267, or whether we were just looking, or whether you know staff was just looking at what seemed to come up um, that was knocked off the list. I hope that that's kind of a understandable um, viewpoint. But uh, as the presentations go on, perhaps some comment could be made to those to those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have, does anyone on staff want to uh, respond to uh, Commissioner Tebow? <laughs> this is Sharon Terranova. Uh, and we will be doing that Commissioner Tebow uh, on a few, uh, for a few projects, we did advance projects that were in the five to 10 year pipeline and, uh, because either there was additional match, overmatch provided, or maybe there's a federal grant and we need to take advantage of it now. Um, so it, I'll, I'll point out as we go through the transit projects anyway, I'll point out projects that were not in our original plan, but uh, we advanced them now to, uh, to, to leverage funds or we saw a better opportunity. There's one project that I'll explain um, that where we had a better opportunity uh, for a better public facing project. So I'll go through that as I list the projects. Well, thank you very much, Sharon. <laughs> I, I can touch right. briefly. You know, oh, I, I can touch briefly on it, Chair Stewart, if that's, if that's helpful. I mean, I, I, th I think the reference to the pre-construction amounts kind of answers the question. You know, I you you all will recall that particularly in last year's allocations and during during the kind of worst of the period vis-a-vis -vis financial uncertainty, we were very rigid that funds had to go to shovels in the ground and not to pre-construction work because of the need to. Kind of get you know get 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 things, get things built in real time. You know, part of what we're doing here is being actually much more transparent about when pre-construction is happening relative to the way CDOT has sometimes invested in kind of batch pre-construction work and be, being much more targeted that pre-construction is being done for specific projects that are envisioned in the next you know x number of years pursuant to the plan and not just having it kind of couched under parts of the you know agency budget that are are less sort of specific. In the allocation, so I, I do. I do think that that's the portion of this that's preparing for the next round. Is you know, you, you, you build some, you get ready with the next batch of pre-construction, and then it can kind of rotate rotate from there. But in terms of projects that aren't on the plan, I mean, we're certainly staying focused on projects that are on the plan. 
Thank you. A, a chair to that point, uh, Jennifer, if you could go back one slide. Uh, Paul Josidas, is there anything you wanted to note on the pre-construction projects here? Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna chime in there. So if you look at years five through ten pre-construction, Commissioner Tebow, that's exactly what we're trying to do there. We have 19 million dollars that we're asking for in pre-construction. And those projects are really projects that are on our tenure list, but in years five through ten. So as you know, we have to get us uh, some pre-construction done or we can't advertise the project. So those projects in region one really are the next West Metro bridges, more of those 17 bridges, getting them designed. Kings Valley and US 285, where we have a big safety problem. Uh, bottleneck reduction projects in region one, we've done those very successfully. We've got a wildlife crossing on US 6 in Golden, where we've got a huge elk herd that crosses the road every day and a lot of cars hit the elk. Um, I-70 truck escape ramps, we had that horrible crash um, two years ago where that semi truck killed four people at uh, Denver West. Um, I-25 at State Highway 7, transit, um, pre-construction. Then we've got I-70 Vasquez at 60th in Commerce City. We've got a whole bunch of grade separated pedestrian trails. And then the I-70 climbing lane approaching the Eisenhower Tunnel in the westbound direction. If you travel that, the trucks can't get up that grade. And so we get designing on that. And then um, we've got a problem at the Eisenhower Tunnel. You probably saw the newspaper article. And so we're designing some things to be ready to um, get that tunnel up to today's standards. And, um, and that's what we got. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rich Zamora, are you on? Yes, I am. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, so I just just to, to start this off, I'll, um, I'll talk about each individual specific project. I just wanted to kind of highlight, you know, what we're proposing uh, through our year three request. We'll actually complete all of our years one through four projects with the exception of two. Uh, we've got two large remaining projects that will be left on our list. And that'd be uh, the construction of I-25 through Pueblo and also a section of I-25 in Colorado Springs uh, from Garden of the Gods to Fillmore. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll talk about the specific projects uh, that we're proposing right now. Um, the first being I-25 through New Pueblo Freeway. And this is actually money for pre-construction uh, to keep that project um, moving forward and have it prepared for a potential year four tranche or you know, other stimulus funding that might come our way. So this $12 million would actually complete right away acquisition and final design for that particular project at I-25 and US 50B. Um, the next project is I-25 Ratone Pass, um, phase two. If you recall, um, this is associated with uh, the new state park uh, for Fisher's Peak, um, just south of Trinidad. Um, we had allocated you know, $13 million to this project initially. We, need, we are likely gonna have to do some additional improvements to provide better access to the park. So we're proposing to add an additional million dollars above that initial 13 that you had approved previously. Uh, for the Dillon Drive interchange, um, this is adding back some scope to a project um, that we actually had to eliminate because of budget issues and would actually make this interchange operate more efficiently in, in the Pueblo area. So this is the very north end of Pueblo off of I-25. And then Sharon, I'm going to turn it over to you for some of the uh, transit projects that are on I-25. Sure. Thanks, Rich. So uh, we are building a North Pueblo mobility hub. Um, this is for land purchase or lease, design and construction of a new mobility hub with 100 to 200 parking spaces for CDOT's bus tang. We're currently looking at the uh, former Kmart site on Elizabeth Street at I-25 and Highway 50. Uh, this would activate a stop for uh, bus tang, serve bus tang line. Um, there's also a Pueblo transit bus stop right there. And also it serves the Ramblin Express service. Um, the next project is the South Central Storage and Maintenance Facility, and this is uh, the design and construction of a new bus storage and maintenance facility for uh, Trinidad that would house SC COG Transit and also support Phase 3 Outrider uh, service from Trinidad to Pueblo. Uh, that would store two Bustang Outrider vehicles, and it's also located directly across from the Mount San Rafael Hospital. So um, there might be some opportunities there for future fix, fixer out stops. 
The next project is the Southwest Jeep Track Improvements. This is just a, a grant match that we wanted to keep available um, should another, you know, grant opportunity uh, should we apply for the next round of the grant uh, opportunities uh, with federal grants. So we kept this project in here. Uh, this is this is for uh, a portion of track improvements, rail replacements, turnouts, and grade crossing replacements on the La Junta sub between Kansas and Colorado. Um, we're also uh, looking at alternatives analysis and pre-construction activities for the Woodman Road Mobility Hub, um, and that would be either expansion or relocation of that bus tank stop in Colorado Springs, and. Uh, another grant uh, opportunity uh, for 5339B uh, facilities. Um, we are keeping money on the books for that for uh, the Pueblo admin and maintenance facility. They applied for this in the past. We allocated funds to that and the, the application was unsuccessful. So we wanna apply again. This is an expensive project and uh, somewhere between 15 to $20 million, they think. So we wanted to uh, provide support for that project. The, um, let's see, what do we have? Uh, Monument Park and Ride will be doing some ADA improvements there right now. We are uh, unable to do a full uh, redesign of that park and ride because the port of entry limits our um, access to the highway. And the last project on this list is uh, the, let's see, did I do? Oh, it's on the next page, I'm sorry. There should be. Okay. Okay, you can go there and then I'll finish. Sorry okay. about that. So uh, the next project on our list is uh, State Highway 21, a research parkway interchange. Um, and if you'll recall, as part of the, the federal stimulus that came out around uh, you know, the start of the new year, um, we received a loan from Transportation Commission Program Reserve of $19.5 million. And this is actually just a line to show we're paying back that loan out of the year three Senate Bill 267 funds. Um, the next project on our list is State Highway 115, um, and this, this project will add some shoulders on State Highway 115 as well as some XL diesel lanes and do some re, uh, resurfacing or pavement reconstruction. Um, and this particular project straddles both the, uh, um, the Fremont and El Paso County line, so um, it, it actually provides improvements for both uh, PPACG as well as Central Front Range. Um, the next project on 287. Um, this is a continuation of a project that we had to uh, downscope last year due to the COVID uh, situation associated with funding. So basically this allows us to just complete that project, uh, the second half of that project um, going forward. Um, the next project we're actually bringing in from years five through 10, we had to bring in a couple of projects just to make the math work in terms of the allocation that was being proposed for the region. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with State Highway 12, this is one of our scenic byways, but it also provides access to a a mine that is going to become active again, likely this summer. Um, and so this is a very narrow road. Um, and we're looking at doing some shoulder widening on this as well as potentially some resurfacing um, to help with some safety issues. It also provides, it, it ties in very closely with the Southern Mountain Loop uh, bicycle trail that's been proposed or multi-use trail that's being proposed uh, through a planning environmental linkage study that we had. Um, and finally, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Sharon, to talk about the, the mobility hub. Thanks, Rich. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, the, <laughs> the, we're, we're uh, doing some uh, pre-construction design for the Fair Play Mobility Hub. This is for a new mobility hub and parking facility to connect outrider routes along US 285 and will also serve Summit Stage in the future. As I mentioned, the Pueblo uh, Admin and Maintenance Facility, that's grant match funds uh, to, support, to support Pueblo Transit and also uh, we, we utilize that facility as well. And then the last project is the Colorado Springs Downtown Transit Center, also uh, serves Bustang. And this is uh, CDOT's contribution to the construction of a downtown transit center um, at the north, northeast corner of Nevada Ave and Pikes Peak Ave. And that will be the hub for Mountain Metro, local bus operations, Bustang, and Greyhound. It'll also serve taxis, TNCs, we'll have bike share, uh, and it includes city-owned parking and private 
residential, commercial, and office development on the upper floors. All right. Thanks, Sharon. You know, I'm wondering if we could take just a moment and answer Commissioner Gifford's question that she put in the chat, because I, I think this is a question many of us have had about mobility hubs in general. And as you're going through, there's a number of these mobility hubs that have substantially different um, uh, cost amounts. So if you would look in the chat at Commissioner Gifford's question, um, and, and maybe Commissioner Gifford, I'll turn it to you first, and then we'll go to Sharon. And I see Commissioner Adams has a follow-up. Oh, sure. It's just, a, I'm sorry, I wrote a lot, but it's a kind of an open-ended question. We have mobility hubs uh, costed at between 300,000 and 8 million and a bunch at like 500,000. But for example, the one in Fair Play costs more than the one in downtown Grand Junction. So I'm wondering, do we have like a different scope for these? Are these just describing a lot of different kinds of projects or is the, the Delta more parking or something? And also, um, we have a couple of transit centers, like one in Snowmass and one in Colorado Springs and a multimodal transit facility in Montrose. Are those the same kind of animal with a different name or are they something different? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have, they're all different animals. And um, as an example, the, um, the more expensive uh, mobility hubs often uh, will involve, the most expensive we are center median stations, mm -hmm. such as Centera Loveland, um, and that, you know, that's, that's changing the highway. So we're adding managed lanes in and bringing the buses through the center of I-25, for, for example. So that's going to be the most expensive. We also, uh, though, benefit from partnership match on those projects. Uh, an example at Loveland is that we got 40%, just over 40% of that project paid for, uh, by, by partnership funding. So, um, that's an example. Um, the Grand Junction um, right now, that's, that's a, a new project. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that later, but um, that's also a partnership project where we have other transit agencies using it. So um, there's some cost offset to that. And also we're planning to apply for grant for that. So we're using saying, well, let's start out with some seed money really to to get a federal grant. Um, that project hasn't been, I don't think there's a detailed estimate at all. We're still evaluating locations. And in many of these places, we're really at the beginning stages of determining the preferred alternative. Um, some of these projects only have, uh, the projects will need to be phased. So uh, we'll be adding money over time. We might start out with you know, design and then move on to construction. And then some are, um, you know, my slip ramps and a park and ride versus a full center median station. So they all are our different animals. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. And I'll, uh, I'll turn to uh, Commissioner Adams for another uh, follow-up question, please. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I think your answer was helpful to me to part of my my concern, which was very similar to Shannon, I didn't understand the, the full reason for the variability in cost of these, because I tended to think about them like, you know, once you get the model, you know, they, you kind of replicate it in most places. So, so that, was, that was helpful on the capital part of building them out. My question relates to what you call transit pre-construction. And I guess I'm just curious about what's involved in transit pre-construction, is it more, is it a lot more than just design on a site? And, and there must be other activities because it seems to me to be pretty expensive planning kind of work. So can you, can you help me to understand a little bit better about what's involved in transit pre-construction? Sure. So uh, several different things are involved in the pre-construction and initially we, we are looking at um, where we should site the, you know, we need to do a lot of analysis on where the riders are coming from and where they're going to and uh, what is the preferred location. We need to do a lot of conceptual design. We might be looking at four different alternatives. Um, so there's some work involved in that. And then there's environmental work um, to clear the land. And then there's also um, some design and design is, is a big is a big piece of um, 
That is a big chunk well, of the well, I can see that I can see that now based on your explanation that projects are different in complexity, size, and scale, and partners involved as well. So I can see that all of those, I just tend to look at a lot of this. Initially, I thought more like an old professional services guy in terms of the kind of planning and and uh, activity around it. And it just seemed to me to be pretty expensive uh, stuff. But you also said there's actually some site clearance and environmental testing that's actually done as well. That's correct. And there's a lot of engineering. Sometimes we have differing site conditions and we have to drill more, more holes, say, to for the test holes to determine what is the appropriate treatment for that the engineering treatment for that location. No, thank you. That makes sense to me. I, I understand completely. Thanks for your comment, Commissioner Adams. Um, and I'd like to say this is something I've thought about for an awful long time about the um, definition of mobility hub and how it, it's different uh, from different uh, other agencies who call out mobility hubs and that there's a whole range of what does that mean. I'm thinking that it might be a good opportunity in the near future to have a workshop on this and to really talk about what are we trying to accomplish here and how do these decisions get made for where these mobility hubs get investment. I think you've given us a good quick overview, but it is pretty complicated. And I think as we continue to allocate funding for these and meet the goal that we have to put in these mobility hubs across the state, um, I think a workshop would be in order and it doesn't have to be the next month, but you know, maybe in the next few months, uh, we could have a more lengthy explanation of the importance of mobility hubs, what their function is, the, the, the uh, different alternatives, that kind of thing, so that we can understand this a little more clearly and uh, appreciate that. I hope that's not too heavy a, a, an ask, but I was gonna bring that up at breakfast tomorrow and this is probably a more appropriate time to re to uh, add that and I see um, Kate Kelly says she's happy to do that and I so appreciate that uh, I think this is um, a, a pretty um, exciting opportunity for the state of Colorado to have these kinds of additions and so to understand them and understand why we have a, a vast difference in in some of these and whether they're a mobility hub or whether they're a transit center that would be helpful. So thanks very much for that. Let me just see if there's anything else here. All right, that's good. Please continue. All right, commissioners. Um, and finally, you know, just to cover some of the rural paving projects that are still the focus um, statewide, as well as for region two. So we've identified a, a four uh, rural paving projects to, to come out of Senate Bill 267 year three. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory. So unless there's any specific questions about a, a project, um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, I'll I'll take us on to, to Region 3 then. Mike Goolsby, are you on? Yes, I am, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, so uh, I guess I'm going to steal a little bit of Sharon's thunder here, um, Chair Stewart with uh, the Mobility Hub in Grand Junction. And one of the reasons I want to bring it up is the first project that we have on the list is I-70B east of 1st to 15th Street. Um, uniquely um, or ununiquely, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, we had uh, Greyhound after 75 years left their, their current location in Grand Junction. So um, currently Grand Valley Transit is hosting Greyhound and our bus tank service um, at one of their uh, transfer facilities. Um, during that conversation, one of the opportunities that may come up for us is depending on where the um, city and county and Grand Valley Transit decides to put their um, new mobility hub, um, it may get incorporated into our I-70B projects. So there's a really good opportunity there to maybe do a project all at once um, get both of those taken care of. Um, and then Sharon can talk more specifically about um, the planning money for that or the, the pre-construction money for that. Um, I-70, the auxiliary lane um, between Frisco and Silverthorne, uh, this is a really good project because it, it ties Frisco and Silverthorne together. It addresses some downhill truck safety issues there. Um, we have an opportunity to improve the truck parking and some, and some chain station stuff there. 
Um, it ties those two interchanges together for future work in years five through 10 with the opportunities to do some improvements to the uh, Frisco and Silverthorne interchanges. Um, State Highway 92 Rogers Mesa is a continuation of our um, project from Delta to Hotchkiss to uh, make large improvements to the 92 corridor. Um, this area specifically has no shoulders at all with irrigation lines and um, other things right up to the white line. Um, very narrow road, lots of accidents, lots of uh, accesses and site issues. Um, so we're, that's an opportunity. Um, again, addressing the US 550 corridor, same thing. Um, in addition to the intersection improvements at US 50 and 550, um, these are uh, projects within Montrose itself. Um, the U.S. Fruta to Palisade safety improvements, um, you'll see that's listed three times. Um, and if you guys recall back uh, when we first set up the 267 list, we had a project that was identified as U.S. 6 Fruta to Palisade safety improvements, and it was for about $34 million. These are additional phases of that that include that's inclusive of that $34.5 million. So, Sharon, I'll let you talk about the Mobility Hub if you want. Sure, thank you. Well, we're, we're just in the very beginning stages of uh, scoping out the Mobility Hub. We just had our fir first workshop this week uh, to talk about uh, what uh, the different stakeholders think is important uh, at this Mobility Hub in Grand Junction. Uh, and we have uh, proposed $500,000 um, for uh, to do location, you know, alternatives analysis and to get set up for um, applying for a federal grant. So that's that's where we're at right now. Um, all in, we're looking at uh, a proposed funding of uh, four point, almost $4.6 million for the Grand Junction Mobility Hub, but we're starting out with 500,000 uh, to get the project rolling. And then Jennifer, I think you can jump to the next page if you want. Oh, I think you went backwards. <laughs> Sorry, is that the right page? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead then and continue on with the transit improvements. So uh, we are uh, working with uh, Grant, uh, Gunnison Valley RTA on uh, the design and construction of a new bus storage facility in Crested Butte that will serve both uh, Gunnison Valley RTA and Bustang Outrider. Um, so that's a project that's on, ongoing. We started that in uh, years one and two, funding of Senate Bill 267, and this, this will complete the project. Uh, the Snowmass uh, Transit Center, I know uh, Commissioner Gifford brought this up. This is a rather unique opportunity here. Um, where um, it's, a, it's a new transit center in the central ski mountain area and the facility replaces two older transit centers built in 1969 and 1987. And it'll include about 150 parking spaces. It will have en route chargers for RAFTA buses providing the Aspen service and also have electric vehicle chargers for the public. Um, this has been advanced from uh, the years five through 10 pipeline of projects. And uh, the reason for that is a uh, great overmatch. Um, the, the elected officials uh, in Aspen, Pitkin County and the town of Snowmass Village have put up uh, $6 million for this project. So um, that's better than our 50% and we're really happy with that. So we are hoping that uh, we're hoping that uh, this increases the capacity and they think also that it's going to, um, let's see, they're gonna add 10% increase in service levels when they complete this project, which is, which is pretty big. So um, just tout the benefits of that project. Uh, the Montrose Multimodal uh, Transit Facility, this is a new project. Um, we formally uh, allocated funding for a storage and maintenance facility, a Western Slope Storage and Maintenance Facility. And right now, uh, three agencies, uh, we, Bustang, Outrider, Smart, 
and All Points Transit all contract out for their maintenance right now. And uh, the city of Montrose uh, donated land for um, All Points Transit to relocate to this new, new site. And we're going to be able to bring SMART there. We're going to be able to bring uh, Bustang Outrider there. And uh, there will be parking. Um, there will be, it's uncovered, but there will be secured storage for All Points Transit and also um, SMART. And then we'll, we'll still have to store, do a small project to store Outrider buses hopefully at the uh, Region 3 Maintenance Center there north of the airport. So um, that's that's connected to this project. That's the $500,000 for that. We don't really have, um, we haven't gone into a detailed estimate on that yet, but um, we're hoping we can store four buses for that. And um, let's see. And then just keeping in mind that we should keep the, the maintenance facility in the pipeline of projects for years five through 10. But right now we feel that this is a better opportunity and, and public facing. Uh, let's see. And then we also have some outrider stops um, where we're making uh, improvements with bus stops and pads and bike racks and such. Next slide, please. And uh, these are our uh, Region 3 uh, rural paving projects. Um, a couple of them that I'd point out is the first one is the State Highway 114 Parlin job. And that is a partnership with Region 5 um, where we're pooling funds together um, to deliver a project um, that Region 3 will manage. Um, fortunately, with some savings from prior year rural paving and um, the, the funds that we would receive from year three, um, we were able to advance a couple of our year four rural paving projects into year three and combine them for some cost savings. That would be the two State Highway 139 jobs. And then the Colorado 149 resurfacing project, um, that's another partnership with Region 5 um, that we're pooling funds that Region 5 will deliver. Um, part of the reason that we're asking for it this year and Region 5 will ask for it later is due to the fact of the construction of Little Blue Canyon. Um, to finish some design work and some other things to be able to leverage that so we can start construction fairly quickly. And I'd entertain any questions. Okay, I will take us on to region four. I believe Heather Paddock is on annual this week. Rich Christie, are you on? Yeah, Rebecca, I'm on, can you hear me okay? Yeah, good afternoon, Commission. Uh, my name is Rich Christie. I'm a program engineer in, in uh, Region 4. So I'm going to cover this list uh, for Heather today. And our first corridor is I-25, and it is all transit requested projects. So Sharon, did you want to cover those? Sure, thanks. OK, so uh, the first project on the list here is the Firestone Longmont Mobility Hub Access Improvements. And uh, this is a full, full movement intersection that we would uh, construct and this would allow our users of the bus tank service at the park and ride to actually make a safe left turn on out of our park and ride. Um, this is going to occur on the uh, south lot, which we are purchasing. That's the next very next project on the list here. Um, and so it, it is not throwaway. It will be used for our ultimate center median uh, station as well. Uh, the Firestone Longmont Mobility Hub phase two right-of-way purchase is just the fact that the, um, the land came in higher than anticipated. So originally um, we had planned for 2.5 million. It came in just under 3.5 total. So we needed to add uh, money to that project in order to secure the land. Uh, the Berthed Mobility Hub we are also adding funding to this project. Um, this, this, completes, this will complete the build out of the uh, center median station there. We've added a, a bus loop there for local transit. Um, and uh, we benefited from the stimulus funds that region four allocated to this project. We also have partnership match from the developer, developer in this project. Uh, continuing, North, the Centera Loveland Mobility Hub. 
that's $500,000 and that covers um, additional wayfinding signage, programmable information displays, and uh, the EV chargers at the station. And then there is the Harmony Park and Ride expansion. And this is just um, some pre-construction work activities, a uh, little design to figure out how we would go about expanding that property. All right, thank you. Um, for non-corridor specific, we're requesting some funding for pre-construction activities. And it's a combination of some out-year projects uh, like on Highway 71 and 385. And uh, to continue design on one of our year four projects on the 119 corridor. Um, then we have uh, some busting fleet purchases that I think Sharon covered earlier uh, with the region one update. On the next slide, uh, we get into the rural paving projects. And you know, your uh, region four got out of the gate pretty quickly with our I-25 project, and we got ahead on um, on our equity calculations. And so, the the list of rural pavings lower this year. We you know expect next year to catch up and hit our target. Um, Commissioner Tebow, the uh, this first project here for Highway 71 is an example. I think it's in the spirit of what you were asking before. Um, we had a year five project on on Highway 71 to do some resurfacing, and um, actually, we had a, a year one project, and with everything up in the air early in, in COVID, we had to um, make a decision to lock down the scope and go to go out to add with a project on Highway 52 that had we had the Senate bill money, we would have added shoulders to that job. Um, we went with the funding that we, we knew for certain out of our resurfacing program and wanted to come back with a future year project to, to really do the same thing. And the Highway 71 corridor offers us an upcoming um, opportunity to do the same thing. We have some RPP money planned for that corridor, and we wanted to add a, a, a climbing lane in multiple locations between Lyman and Brush. Um, that's where we think we'll get the biggest bang for, for some early investments along that corridor, connecting highways or Interstate 70 and 76. Um, so we're, we're requesting 6 million to add to another 5.8 of RPP money to really make that, um, that series of projects be more effective. Um, and hi the Highway 30, 138 project, it would add shoulders for this request, this 1.75 million, add shoulders to an existing resurfacing project. Um, so again, trying to leverage projects we have in the pipeline and, uh, and get the best bang for the buck on those. And that's all of our projects. I'm happy to take any questions if you, if you have any. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brackey is on my queue for questions. Um, thank you all so much. A great presentation and um, appreciate all, all the work. Um, I, I really appreciate how you asked at the beginning of the presentation, the combining of the highway and the transit part together. To me, that's been really helpful to see this as we've been walking through it this afternoon. And I sat through the staff meeting and I just think it's a really good way to be showing this integrated multimodal transportation system approach. So I wanted to say thank you for for um, doing it that way, and hopefully it's something we can continue um, to show um, holistically together. Um, I also think it's great that you factored in for each of the regions, or at least the ones we've seen so far, the pre-construction activities, because again, as we've been talking, it's so hard to get our projects what considered ready to go if we're not investing in that, that front end. And I, I think that's a, a critical piece. So thank you for doing that and for, for doing that in region four as well. Um, and in one of the questions I've been um, out talking with, with folks about the, the projects, and I think the region, the year three projects look really good. Um, there is a question that's come up around the Santera Loveland Mobility Hub, and I'm hoping that the region four staff are having a chance to talk with the city of Loveland about that and the, the funding gap for that particular location. So I just wanted to convey uh, that they had shared that with me and if there's hopefully a way that staff from CDOT and Loveland can work together on a solution would be great. Um, and then looking forward, I know we're focused on year three today, but my, my hope again, based on these conversations is that um, just as we've talked about in the other regions, it, it's really important to have the maintenance facilities to support the transit operations. 
and I'm excited that as we go forward and we come through COVID, hopefully we can add back um, the North line for Mustang. Um, but we really need to also be looking forward to how to provide the, the Mustang or Outrider service along US 34 and connecting from Estes Park to Loveland and Greeley and out to Sterling. And my understanding from prior conversations is those types of additional transit services aren't possible, not only from a funding standpoint, but just logistically, if we don't start looking at a way to create a Northern Colorado maintenance facility for, for transit, for CDOT. And one of the suggestions I'd like to encourage you to consider is reaching out to the local agency staff that already have transit maintenance facilities. City of Loveland, City of Fort Collins, City of Greeley are all running transit systems. So could there be an opportunity for CDOT to partner um, with one of those other transit agencies to create a shared Northern Colorado transit maintenance facility. So again, I, I realize we're trying to fit a lot into these um, amounts of money <laughs> each year. So while they, these may not fit in year three, I would like to start talking about how do we not lose sight of them for the future. If there is an opportunity, um, as Rebecca was saying on the front end of this, this dollar amount is a forecasted target. If that were to change in a positive direction, then perhaps some of these other uh, requests that are coming from the Northern Colorado communities for transit could be um, considered. So I'm just, again, sharing this ideas and suggestions and again, appreciate all the work and really appreciate looking at this holistically to put together the, the multimodal uh, view. So thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Brackey, great comments. I'll turn it back to you, Rebecca. Okay, I'll uh, close this out with Region 5. I believe Kevin Curry is filling in for our new RTD, Julie, who's on leave this week. Thanks, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Commission. I'm Kevin Curry, I'm the Region 5 Program Engineer. And this week I'm carrying a couple of extra hats. Um, for Region 5, um, I'll let Sharon address the two transit projects and then I can talk about the project reconstruction funding, Sharon. Great, thank you. The Salida Transit Capital Improvements uh, were not identified in the years one through four capital program. This project actually uh, came through a larger application for the multimodal options funds and uh, didn't didn't get the funding and we were able to pull out transit improvements out of that application. Uh, so this includes two bus stops on US 50 and also uh, safe pedestrian crossings with ADA walkway improvements. Uh, and um, this will serve uh, Chaffee County uh, Transit and also Outrider. So uh, this is $920,000 they will be bringing a uh, match to this project. And the Poncha Springs Outrider Improvements, we originally had a larger uh, project at Poncha Springs and uh, the town withdrew. They were, the town withdrew their application from the capital call and we still need an outrider stop at that location. So these are funds to create an outrider stop at that location. Thank you, Sharon. And then for pre-construction funding, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, for um, the pre-construction work that we need to get done, we've had to, we've pulled in years five through 10 projects in order to get the head start on it and, and be ready for when funding becomes available. It's a combination of both capital and rural road paving projects. And you can see that we're pretty well covering all corners of the region from the, the Four Corners area up through Pagosa Springs and up north uh, Buena Vista, the granite paving job west of Antonito out in the valley and between Ignacio and Arbles. Um, next slide, please. And then our, our rural paving projects, um, we've taken uh, we US-160, this is the last phase of uh, US-160 that comes in from the Four Corners. Um, we have been working on trying to get this job out for a number of years and just didn't have funding available until 267 came along. Um, we are joining forces on this project. The, uh, 
New Mexico Department of Transportation has an eighth of a tenth of a mile stretch that runs from the Four Corners through New Mexico into Arizona. And they've uh, agreed to participate financially to join forces on this project to make it one job that we would manage. Um, US 550 Billy Creek is a resurfacing project that will include uh, a wildlife underpass that was originally part of a capital improvement job on 550 in that area. We've decided to pull out and try to address the wildlife underpass separately in order to address some of the uh, animal vehicle hit mitigation work that's undergoing in that stretch. And then as Mike uh, alluded to earlier, a state highway or Colorado 149 resurfacing job is our rural road job that we've joined forces with region three on that we will design and we will build. And um, that will take us in through over the passes through Lake City and north of that. And that's a rural paving job. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. It looks like there aren't any questions um, in the queue. Great presentation. And give it back to you, Rebecca. All right. Well, it, the, the final slide there was just to note um, the next steps are really re to return to you for a, a final decision on the use of the Senate Bill 267 Year 3. Right now, we're targeting that for either April or May. And, staying closely connected with, with Jeff, of course, on the timing of that. Uh, so I appreciate the time today. I know that was a lot to cover, but um, thank you all for the questions and the input and uh, happy to take any other questions. If not, we'll be back probably next month. Uh, Mr. Vasquez has a question and Commissioner Stanton. Yeah, Rebecca, I just wanted to thank you for integrating uh, in a regional way both the highway and the transit. I found that comprehensive look, including the pre-construction, extremely helpful to get that regional view. So thank you very much. Mr. Stanton. Thanks, Chief Stewart. I really appreciate Engineer Curry's uh, mention of the cooperation with the state of New Mexico and able to get uh, funding in there. It's really great to see some regional cooperation. And overall, this was a wonderful presentation of all five regions. It really helps. Thank you. And Commissioner Adams. So uh, I'd like to compliment everyone as well. I, I thought everything was very, informative and Rebecca, I do like the way you've combined transit with all the other projects. It, it really was helpful to me to have a more comprehensive look at everything at the same time. So I have one question of Kay Kelly though. So Kay, question for you, at, going all the way back to the beginning with the very first question that Commissioner Stanton asked about uh, the inclusion of more EV uh, in there, and, and your answer was very clear, so I'm not questioning <laughs> the answer you gave about the lack of feasibility for the, you know, buses and our ability to acquire buses that are more uh, uh, EV uh, buses, and that technology and the concern around batteries and the length of the trips. Are, are there no places where we can pilot something with buses that are EV and maybe acquire one on some shorter routes that would enable us to get an earlier start so that we can be communicating to people what we're doing here. And I know that there's research being done on battery life and battery capability. So it just seems to me like there's an opportunity here for us to get an earlier start if we can figure out some ways to do it. And I just wanna encourage us to continue to push for something that would put us and keep us in that innovative lane for people who are out front on this. So, so that's just uh, my observation and my comment. And I'm sure you're doing that anyway, because I've just learned that about you that I'm sure you're thinking about it. I just wanted to offer some encouragement from this one commissioner to say, if we can move faster on this and do something that would be impactful even if it kind of maybe caused us to stray from a more straightforward business-like approach to doing it, 
I would one be supportive of that kind of effort from my standpoint. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. And, and yeah, to, to be clear, we, um, we very much wanna embrace this technology. We very much wanna move in that direction, um, but we know that we need to kind of do our homework so that, you know, we can, that vehicle can do the job that it needs to do, right? So, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, by definition, Bustang and Outrider have very long routes. Um, it's just a fact. Um, and those routes are, you know, on I-25 and the vehicles are traveling, you know, 70 miles an hour, long distances. And right now the, the technology just isn't there. Uh, we are watching it closely and we are eager for the point that the technology is there. Um, a preview, we are going to be talking about the Office of Innovative Mobility budget next month. And some of the things we're going to be talking about is some of the planning work that we can do to, to prepare ourselves for, um, you know, first of all, to understand what our drive cycle looks like, what, what, what size of battery, what range of battery we need, kind of what ballpark that the technology needs to be in for us to start raising our hand and saying, we're ready, that vehicle meets our needs. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, where we're going to have to put on route charging, where we're going to have to put depot charging. Um, and in addition, some of the things that we can be doing right now are really helping the more local transit agencies who have those shorter routes to do those planning studies to understand what they need to do to incorporate them into their fleets. So even if Bustang Outrider doesn't have that technology right away, um, we're trying to really support the local transits that have the routes that are more suitable for the current technology capabilities so that at least maybe they're connecting into our service in that. And again, waiting, waiting patiently for when we have a vehicle that we can use ourselves. Well, I know, I know you're there. I'm not questioning that commitment and interest. I, would, I just wanted to be a voice for the other commissioners. And I know several of them feel as strongly about this as I do. So I just wanted to again, reiterate, you have lots of support, I think, for whatever you come up with. And I know you'll get us there as quickly as feasibly possible. So just wanted Thank to you. just be another voice to say that. But I'm fully supportive of what you're doing right now. Commissioner Stewart, could, could I make a comment on, on, on back on the, the, the list we just looked at? Yes, please, Commissioner okay. Hall. Okay. I just, I, I wanted to point out, especially to Kathleen Brackey, who is our representative on the scenic byways, on the list from Region 5, where they're doing some paving, that two of those is scenic, are scenic byways. One of them is the Dinosaur Diamond, which you're aware of, and the other one is the Highway 140. And the reason that's so important that we're getting some paving on that is because um, those are very difficult to keep in good shape and they have really deteriorated. And the, we had a few letters a, a few years back where people were suggesting that we take uh, that 140 off of the scenic byways because, um, because, because it was in such bad condition. So it's very exciting to me to have some paving going on that. that. That is a hard area to keep up, but it's really important. We've had so much interest this year um, on our scenic byways and a lot of good press about it. So I wanted to be sure to bring that back to Bracky's attention. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brackey. Great, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to, to weigh in and, and uh, Commissioner Hall for raising that about the scenic byways. I do think it's really important and it's such a good example of um, investing in a way to create co-benefits. So it's creating the roadway improvements, the asset management that's so critical. And at the same time, it's creating that connection with the scenic byways and the economic vitality of the communities communities. So I'm just wondering, in the future, as we're listing the projects for the different regions, is there a way to sort of put an asterisk or something that denotes which ones overlap with the scenic byways, so that it is more clear, like how, again, how are we achieving those, those co-benefits of that? So I, I think that's a really great uh, message. Um, I, I also wanted to echo the support for um, ways we can move forward with electrifying transit. Um, as Commissioner Adams mentioned, I think that's really important and anything we can do. I understand the technology limitations, um, but even a way to look at the whole set of customers. And even if the transit vehicle itself can't be electrified yet, perhaps at the park and rides, there can be charging installed to allow customers to charge their um, EVs or 
transportation network companies to charge EVs or something like that. So we can, again, just start normalizing that as a part of the infrastructure we're creating, I think would be helpful. And you're probably already thinking about those things. So thanks for all the good work in that space. Um, my, my question going forward is, we talk a lot about equity and the, the dollar amounts and how we're trying to even that out across all the regions, which I understand and agree is really important. The issue we run into though, particularly in region four is we have that large, um, uber large dollar amount for North I-25 that time and time again keeps skewing the numbers in terms of how much is going to the region versus statewide. And I'm, I'm just wondering as part of one of our future workshops and, and it's, it may be showing up in similar ways in other regions as well. I'm just not as familiar with those. But if there were a way to do a side-by-side -side comparison that says, here's what the um, regional financial geographic equity looks like, including the interstates, and here's what it looks like with, um, holding the interstates out, and what what is that that difference look like? Because you know we're going to go forward and someday, hopefully soon, <laughs> North I-25 will be finished, and, but other regions are gonna be grappling with this too. And so I'm just wondering if looking at some of those numbers might help us create some policy conversations about, do we continue to do it this way? Are there other ways to do it? You know, I-70, I-76, all of these are gonna keep bumping the numbers in, in different ways. So I, I'm not saying we should change it. I'm just saying it would be helpful to look at it and to be able to visualize the Delta under those different scenarios. And curious what other people's thoughts are. That's great, Commissioner, back to you. And I've had this conversation a couple of times. You're absolutely right. It's happening in other areas and it is kind of frustrating when a, a, a large project that serves the whole state um, is part of the um, is part of the budget for that region, and uh, and and yet it serves the whole state. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think Commissioner Hickey has a comment to follow yours. Thank you. We talk about equity and the balance between regions, and I'm still learning what factors go into that. But I'm also interested in knowing to what extent we can say, what is the equity of the investments we make in various mobility options between and among different socioeconomic groups as they are spread around Colorado? And that's a very difficult thing to model or know and it could be sensitive in reporting. I recognize all of that, but I will be interested because I'll just say there's obviously a perception that we local locality, local um, governmental decision makers who um, are on the front range or are more aware of mobility options might promote their project, whereas someone else who would really benefit because of a socioeconomic, um, it, you know, less, less advantage may not put their project forward, may not get the attention, may not get the investment, whereas it would be uh, certainly equitable to invest there. So um, all of that's considered, I know somewhere buried in here, but every once in a while, if we touch on it, that would be helpful to me. Thanks very much for your comments. These are the kinds of things we used to be able to say in person. And, you know, we would then have a little break and then we'd all say, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do a workshop on that. And well, we don't have that opportunity. And the other thing I just have to say in listening to all of the comments is, I, I'm really sad that we're virtual all the time. I would love to have this commission go on a field trip to see some of these wonderful projects and some of the scenic byways that we've just acknowledged. And I'm hoping that future commission chairs who have the opportunity to run these, these meetings in person will consider going back to some of the field trips that were so awfully beneficial to me when I first came on the commission to see all these places and specific projects that um, we're allocating funding to and to see what the amount of money we have goes to do for the state of Colorado. And really feel sad that we're, we're not able to do that as a group and hope in the future 
um, that, that we'll be able to resume those kinds of, um, of field trips. They're so beneficial as we make these important funding decisions. So thank you for that. I don't see anything else in the chat and I think that maybe um, concludes this portion. And if that's so, uh, let's go on to the next item, which is revitalizing Main Street's grant program. I think it's Rebecca again. <laughs> it is. I, I think I get all the fun today. All right, so uh, this topic is, is really based on some great news and new set of funding we got just recently. Um, I want to introduce to the commission, Molly Bly. I think uh, some of you have met or worked with her before. She's helped a lot on the Central 70 project over the years, uh, but she has been tremendous in helping to deliver these grant programs to date. And I'll, I'll kind of ask her to help me run you through these. If you got that next slide, Jennifer. Uh, so if you'll recall uh, back, oh gosh, several months ago when Governor Polis first submitted his Build Back, Build Back Stronger budget proposal to the legislature, it included uh, some recommendations for stimulus dollars focused on transportation. And part of what he called for was to provide more money to invest in, in two existing grant programs that we've had out um, for several months now, those being the Revitalizing Main Streets, uh, which was originally funded with the Multimodal Options Fund dollars. Uh, that's just been such an awesome program. Uh, 71 grants awarded to date, really across every corner of the state and with a, a unique but much needed focus on helping communities build their resiliency to COVID through really their infrastructure investments. So, you know, uh, letting communities kind of move their restaurants into city or into street spaces, uh, better lighting, wider sidewalks, just so we can create more space for people to move around and still go to restaurants and stores and, and um, help keep the economy going. So that was one part. Um, the second grant, grant program was, is Safer Main Streets. This, this program was originally funded with Senate Bill 267 dollars. And if you'll recall, this was really a region one Dr. Cog program that was part of their allocation. Um, and speaking of equity, this was, this was one of the region one uh, Dr. Cog projects. Uh, that also has been really neat to see develop. Um, right now we have going to Dr. Cog, kind of the final allocation there. This was $77 million in total and really focused on tackling um, a disturbing trend we're seeing and an uptick in bike and pedestrian injuries and fatalities, particularly among those really busy urban corridors in and around Denver. So the good news is, is that the legislature um, took up the governor's proposal and went ahead and um, early on in the session allocated this $30 million. So we got that good news. I think it was either last week or, or late into the week prior. And if you move on to the next slide, I'll give you a, a sense of what we propose uh, spending it on. So what we'd like to do is, is take this 30 million and just as the legislature and the governor directed, um, relaunch and focus on these existing grant programs. And the way we do that is twofold. We would take uh, a minimum of 8 million of that 30 and invest it in that, um, those small grants I talked about, those sort of COVID uh, infrastructure resiliency projects. Uh, as part of this relaunch, we'd like to extend the cap from 50,000, which it is now, these were very small grants, but raise that cap to 150,000. And that really reflects what we've heard from some of the cities that they, they love this, these grants, but they have even bigger ideas. So um, we'd like to extend that bump to 150,000. Um, we still have just shy of a million remaining. So actually the total pool here would be uh, closer to 9 million. And similar to what we have now, this would be a rolling application. So every single month we review applications and get money out the door, which the communities really seem to like and helps us um, make sure that we aren't sitting on applications for a long time, particularly kind of given the short burn and the COVID focus here. So then the remaining amount of about 22 million, we would propose putting kind of in this safety bucket. So these larger infrastructure projects. We would cap any individual application up to 2 million. 
this would be statewide. That's a really important point. So we would expand this, this concept we sort of piloted in the Dr. Cog area and move it statewide. Um, but because uh, we have a little bit of money left from the Safer Main Streets program we, we launched earlier, we, would, we do have 1.3 million uh, that we would spend only in the Dr. Cog area. So a little extra money available for this region just to close that out. Um, we also uh, had a great trial with this and, and learned some lessons on really dialing in the, the focus on safety. Um, so I think this relaunch will be um, well informed by what we've learned over the last few months. If you go to the next slide, um, Molly, if you're on, do you wanna walk through the, our thinking on the, the criteria here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually might start with the right side of the screen. Um, these are those smaller community placemaking projects that Rebecca mentioned. Um, looking at 8 million with that additional 900,000 that's remaining, bumping that cap, uh, cap from 50,000 up to 150,000. But the key piece here is that really what we've heard positively from these grants, looking at how the evaluation criteria drive down into the needs of what communities are seeing, we're leaving those evaluation criteria the same and just addressing some of those pieces like funding caps and um, really the pieces that the communities echoed across the state would be beneficial to them. So public health mitigation, really looking at making sure we're getting back to that um, old normal, maybe fingers crossed by summer, um, that COVID mitigation is still one of the key criteria as well as active transportation, really getting people out onto the sidewalk, figuring out how that infrastructure is benefiting pedestrians and cyclists. And then also readiness, getting projects out quickly. And then of course, always looking through that equity economic impact lens as well as public support um, and then innovation. Just loving to see the ideas coming in from around the state. Um, and then on the left side of the screen for the large grants, these grants, this relaunch is really informed by, like Rebecca said, what we learned from region one and how they implemented those, as well as some of the criteria that we've seen be really beneficial through the small grants. So safety is continuing to be a key criteria here, um, looking at 30%, but then the rest of this criteria is kind of small little pieces trying to drive down into active transportation, making sure that's a key component. Readiness, again, we're, we're while these are bigger projects, we're really trying to see what projects are there, ideas that are kind of already started that we can help them get out the door quickly, um, as well as funding needs. So projects that maybe due to COVID or other things that have arisen as a, as a subsequent reaction of COVID, um, are we able to help fill those gaps? Um, making sure that we're getting this to multiple locals, so diversity of funding. If it's someone who's been fully funded by CDOT on multiple grant projects in the last year, are we, are we making sure that we're getting this to other communities as well as those that have tapped in already? Um, and then again, equity, economic impacts, public support, and local match are all um, pieces that were part of those original grants. And the one other piece I'll just add on um, was a, is something Director Liu has really asked us to focus on, which is uh, providing technical assistance to communities as we go through this. Um, particularly on the safety side, we've got some great in-house experts who um, have some wonderful ideas on what works. And so we want um, to uh, open up the dialogue with cities and, and provide some time for them to work with some of our experts to figure out the very best uh, safety solution there. So we'll be making that clear also in the outreach that we're providing technical assistance as well. Um, I just have this last slide. Commissioner Stewart, you want me to close it out and then open it to questions? Okay. So we, we want to move quickly. Um, these are stimulus dollars. They're meant to help the economy um, and that, that means we should uh, not sit on them too long. So uh, we have a resolution for your consideration tomorrow to uh, move forward with this program, um, we'd like to, to launch it ASAP uh, and start, uh, we would continue that rolling basis for the smaller grants. And then we're looking at having the larger ones due in May and then work immediately on getting those dollars out the door. Um, we'll, we'll continue to brief you as we go along. And, and just a side note here that those term positions, I believe you took up last month, the five positions to help on the contract side of the house will really be instrumental here to enable us to, to move these quickly.
So with that, I will turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. I have a stacking order here of questions, but I wanted to ask one first. Uh, under that local match um, for the small grants, is there no requirement for a local match? No requirement. I'll hop in, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, there is a requirement. So it's 10% um, of grant funding requests. So we're really looking at just the small components they're asking to fund. So those have a maximum of 5,000 for the match um, and it's required. So we actually, I should have included it on the evaluation criteria, but for that one, it's, uh, they're eligible if they have it, they're not if they don't. So it's not a percentage piece. 5,000 is their local match on those $150,000? Okay. So for, for that, it will remain 10%. So it will go up to $15,000 for a match for the 150,000. Okay, so it's a 10% local yeah, match. Yeah, 10% 10 per, right. 10 of the grant funding, yeah. Okay, thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, Commissioner Hickey, did you want to speak to this one or was that, were you on the list from the last one? From the last one, thank you, Chair. I'm set. Okay, thank you. Then I'll go to Commissioner Stanton and then Zink. Thanks, Chair Stewart. Uh, Molly, that was a great brief. Uh, on the slide that showed the smaller grants and the larger grants, it said diversity of funding on the larger ones, but didn't say that on the smaller ones. Is that an omission? Because we do want to spread it around as much as possible and take care of the poorest communities among us. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and thank you. I'll, I'll try to clarify it. Um, so diversity of funding for the large grants, we're actually looking at funding sources. So have locals who are submitting applications for that gotten funding from only CDOT or from multiple places or local funding. So the equity piece is actually drilling down more to that, that piece of, of um, need and equity in that in that context. So sorry for the confusion of words. So equity no. is a big piece of, of the funding. Yep, and yeah. I just wanted to emphasize that some of the poor communities may not be able to come up with a 10%. And if there was a way to enable this money to be spread around um, to, to help the poorest among us, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen in-kind come through um, staff hours for in-kind count okay. for this. So we've seen quite a bit of matches from our smaller communities coming through installation costs and use of um, staff time in order to implement them. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brackey. Oh, I'm sorry. If you don't mind, Commissioner Zink's next. Yeah, what about, okay. Like, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, comment that, that that slide one, the picture, that's uh, downtown Durango. So uh, we're a model for that sort of thing. And we're already, the city council has already decided we're going to uh, open that back up. I think starting next Monday, people can start uh, building outside again. Um, my question, though, was uh, a little bit more, you touched on it some about how um, notification happens how does how does Durango find out what's available when and what uh, can you tell me more about that so we we uh, we want to go big <laughs> with this announcement and use all the tools that we have at our discretion so that would include uh, a press release a launch event we've got some pretty thorough uh, long email lists and would certainly look to the commissioners too to help spread the word. Uh, so social media, traditional media, um, email blasts, and then um, Molly and uh, Rachel from the Office of Innovative Mobility have actually been doing presentations to all the transportation planning regions. We'd also like to do that. So those are the ideas at, at top of mind if any commissioners have other thoughts. Um, we've been working closely with Matt Inzio and his team to get ready for this. And I, I think uh, we'll, we'll get the word out. We'll also, of course, use um, CML and CCI and their networks uh, to, to spread the word as well. Good, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bracky. Great, thanks. 
Um, and I agree, this is really exciting and wonderful to see the additional $30 million be approved for the, the program. I think it's, that's fantastic. And certainly this is a project that can help benefit our local communities um, and address our Vision Zero Safety goals. Again, at the same time of helping people to be enjoying the space outside and improving walking and biking and economic vitality. Um, I have a question back on the local match. Um, in addition to a percent um, dollar amount, can that um, also include in-kind services so it's not just cash? Yeah, it, it can. And I, I just met with the review committee actually who's been reviewing these small grants. And that was something that one of the members called out as well to add that in a couple more places. So it is both um, cash and in kind for the small grants. And Rebecca, I believe that's the same for the large grants. Um, you could clarify that probably more than I could. Yes, and Molly, why don't you cover the, um, the match ask on the large? Because I, I don't want to leave commission with the impression that it's only 10% across the board in terms of what we're looking at now. Yes, yes, very good. Um, so for the for the region one rollout of this, federal funds were included. So for region one, a 20% match was required for most of those projects if they had federal funding allocated. With this award, obviously federal funds are not included, um, but match is great when it's possible. But we also recognize that local communities right now, especially are not always able to put up that 20% match. So what we've done is we've encouraged a 20% match, but we are allowing them to explain if they're not able to present that match, they're able to explain why that's the case. And we have actually um, just small point differences. If they provide less of a match with no explanation, they may get a small point decrease in scoring, but we're really trying to make that opportunity available to them that if they can, please provide a match. If they can't explain why, and we'll take those on a case by case basis under consideration. Okay, but in either case, it, it's not only cash, it's in kind would count in those yes. categories. Okay, yes. I think that's really important. And however you can include that in the messaging, I think it needs to be really crystal clear because that's been a point of, that I've heard has been a point of con uh, confusion. And then I think I, I really appreciated your slide around the project criteria. And again, feedback that I've heard is there, there seemed to have been uncertainty around the project selection criteria or the selection process in the prior round. So local communities were asking for more explicit clarity on the goals of the money, the evaluation criteria, and then how to, how to have that project selection process kind of honor what the rules are at the front end. So I think that would be helpful. And, and it's great, I think, you know, personally, um, we had the prior round, like you were saying, and we were able to learn a lot from that and then be able to apply those lessons learned here. Um, you mentioned the additional staffing that was approved by the commission earlier this year. Are, are those positions in place now? Because that, again, I'm just sharing concerns I'm hearing from others around the time it's taking. We all want to get the money out in the communities quickly. And so people are saying they're still working on their projects from the last round. <laughs> and so just curious kind of what the chain of events are to help people in the local communities who apply and are awarded this money be able to, to move quickly. Um, and so I guess those are the things that I'm, the questions that I've, I've heard from people. Rebecca, I'll let you take the staffing question. Actually, I, I, I was going to Hollywood Square over to, to Jeff Sudemeyer there. Yeah, yeah, I, I can answer that uh, question. Um, so all of the, so there's five positions and I'm, I'm not going to have exact details on all of them, but I believe uh, the two of them have been filled. I believe that uh, one or two of them uh, are posted right now, meaning we're, we're recruiting. And I believe one has been posted and is closed and is going through the selection process. So they are moving pretty quickly um, to, to already have some of those folks on board and to basically have uh, the rest of them in progress and soon to close um, is, uh, is pretty good. Yeah, so we, we should have them all filled, I'd say, in the next, uh, probably the next four to six weeks is, a, is a, an estimate. 
Oh, that's wonderful news. And I'll be glad to share that with people when they're asking me about it. So I appreciate the update. Thank you. Sure. That's great. Commissioner Vasquez and Commissioner Stanton. Yeah, I was just curious uh, for those small towns who have a state highway that are uh, two lane main street, if you have examples of how they've leveraged this safer main streets uh, money to do an extension of business outside. I'm, I'm having a hard time imagining it. Yeah, I can, I can jump in just on the very technical side of that is we have fair market value waivers from the Federal Highway Administration right now. So technically it's allowed and they're able to do that onto state highway with the exemption. Um, it does become more difficult. So we've seen quite a few activations and alleyways behind businesses. Um, we've seen quite a few who have taken some parking spaces and tried to be creative with how they convert parking lots into covered spaces where people can be outside. And we've also seen quite a few activations of public parks and putting structures into public parks that are adjacent to or nearby the downtown area to expand and have public access for seating um, and amenities. So yes, the, the technical piece, they can do that with exemptions, but from a space crunch side, they've been expanding into other spaces. Yeah, and considering safety with uh, 18 wheelers <clears throat> going down those streets through small towns, it's yeah. inconceivable to me that you'd actually be able to do it safely. So thank you. Yeah, communities have been very creative. <laughs> and, and Mike Goolsby um, is offering a, a example for us. Uh, Commissioner Vasquez, if, you, if I could, um, a good example of that was Hotchkiss. Um, down here in Region 3, uh, one of the things that they utilized a portion of their grant money the first time was to um, purchase a uh, temporary barrier. And they placed the temporary barrier along the, the highway there in, in, on Highway 92 so that they could extend out those businesses and have a safe area for them for that specific reason of having uh, vehicles cross over. Um, Uniquely enough, it does snow once in a while around here. So we uh, had to put a stipulation in that they remove that before winter time so we could get our plows through there and, and the city could do snow removal, but it worked very, it worked very well. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, if you have any pictures, send them my way. I'll share them in, in some of uh, Northwest Colorado communities who might be interested. That's great. Thank you, Commissioner Stanton. Thanks, Chair Stewart. I am so proud and impressed by what Molly, Mike, Rebecca have said about this because this is a nexus of safety and also economic vitality, small communities. And often the small communities are the ones that get passed by by these big state programs. And I'm wondering two things. One, can this program be increased next year? Or two, is there any way to put more money into this, especially for the smallest communities among us, the ones that are isolated, that they can start to stimulate a little more of their economy during this critical next year. And I, I'm like Eula Adams. I, I feel this is a very important thing now, if there's any way we can push it forward. Yeah, I'll respond in, in part to that, at least, Commissioner. You know, these are one-time stimulus dollars, the, the 30 million from the state legislature um, we were able to get both of these programs launched with the Senate Bill 267 and Multimodal Options Fund. Um, but, you know, it, uh, defer back to the commission if you'd like to see some options for more long term, we can certainly look at that. Uh, I, I would say that the amount of money here, at least on the, the small grants, I think is, is, is definitely sufficient um, based on what Molly has seen so far. Okay. And we've had about 4 million so far come in. We have about a million left to spend. So I think we've found the, the right amount of money here for the, those small grants in particular, but we'll stay in touch with you. And the other thing to consider is legislatively to obviously give the, the legislators a report on how well this has been received and that they might uh, choose to put more money into it in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Beatty. Yeah, um, I think this program has been good to address the, the shorter term, one, two years need to address getting that outdoor uh, distance 
so restaurants and businesses could stay open or try to stay in business. Um, I do think with our shortfall of funding just for the maintenance of our system, we need to be careful of having CDOT try to do too much um, of the economic development and all the other things that communities need. I think our biggest piece we need to focus on as a commission is making sure we have a good sound statewide infrastructure so everybody can get there, travel safely between the communities and make sure the infrastructure through the community is in good shape. Um, I think we need to be careful of getting pulled into all the other factors of our economy um, that can actually deplete our main focus, which is our transportation system on a statewide basis. So just to bring in a different view on, on that. I think it's been a good program to address the short-term need as our vaccines get widely distributed. Um, I think this is gonna start waning on the, the, the short-term need um, for the health crisis that we were in. So thank you. This is Kathy, and I agree with what you just said because we surely aren't going to see an end of this at some point that we're not going to have to keep doing this. And when we say increasing it, I think they're, I think from what I've heard from staff, they really are actually getting um, as many grants as they need, and they're not getting more requests than they actually need this money for. So I think we need to use some sense about this that we are not going to be in this situation where we're going to have to have these uh, forever. I think it's an opportunity for right now to help restaurants stay in business, but I don't think we should plan that this is something that's going to go on forever. Thank you, Commissioner Hickey and then Commissioner Buford. I just uh, respect Commissioner Reedy's uh, comments and Commissioner Hall's comments, and I think it's a balance. And my personal view is that people are overly optimistic about how we're going to come out of COVID because, sadly, in the country as a whole and in our state, not everybody is doing the distancing and masking. And I think that there are new variants coming and that we may be facing more of this longer than the optimistic view. But that's personal. Mr. Hickey. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you, Chair. I agree that a balance is a great idea to keep in mind. And as many examples as you can provide for some of the more rural areas to benefit, because some of them say flatly, I don't have a main street. I can't benefit. Um, but I, you know, so a balance is most appropriate, I think. Thank you, Commissioner um, Gifford and then Zink. I, I just wanna put in a plug for, for continued funding of these kinds of initiatives. I think that you know the changes at least that have been made in some areas of Denver have been really terrific and I'd like to see them be made more permanent. Um, you know, there are situations like Larimer Square where and people have been saying for years, you know, you really should close this and open it up and bring the restaurants out into the street and just leave enough room for emergency vehicles to get through. And now that we've seen that actually being done, everybody's like, well, well, yeah, like, why didn't we do this years ago? And furthermore, why don't we make it permanent? <coughs> and I think there are other areas around town that are perhaps a little slower off the starting blocks, but are experimenting um, with ways to kind of create more active pedestrian environments. Um, given, you know, and it was an emergency that sort of got some of this started, but I don't think that once the emergency ends that we should necessarily say that we just sort of want to go back to status quo ante in terms of how we use our parks and our streets and so forth. I think there have been a lot of creative ideas that um, I would love to see continue into the future, regardless of the progress of the epidemic. And I, I, I'm sort of on the generally optimistic side where I think that, you know, we've shown that we can make vaccines, we can make vaccines against whatever variants come along and um, we will eventually get this under control. It might be a little bit more slow than, than we might hope. But I, I honestly think that, you know, by late this summer, at least, we should be in a more normal environment in terms of disease, but in terms of the kinds of um, improvements we've made um, in, in the ways we use our streets, I hope that that continues. So I've gone on too long, but 
I just want to put in a plug for continuing to do this. Thanks. Can I insert direct who here and then go to Commissioner Zink and Commissioner Brackey? Uh, th th thanks. Just a few kind of comments in response to a number of the items that have come up. I think in terms of the actual distribution so far, if we haven't sent around the full list of recipients to date, it would be worth sharing that because it's a very far reaching list. I, I, I think we've got, um, you know, we, we, we've got sort of the Denvers and the Boulders, but we also have uh, Hugo, Hugo, Lyman, Frisco, um, several in Grand Junction. I mean, they, they've really been all over the map in terms of what communities have been choosing to benefit from this in ways that are you know, ranging and often quite specific to the places where they're coming from. And there's been a lot of local discretion in terms of the types of improvements that they've been making. And you know, we've weighed those against eligibility with the Attorney General's office where there's questions, but it's very much governed by kind of local preferences about how to use the space in a manner that's safe relative to our system. So it's it's not like anyone's forcing any of these solutions on the communities. And I think it's, wor it's worth looking at the diversity of who has received the funding so far, because it's actually surprised us. And I think if you haven't read the whole list, it will, it's not what you would expect. Um, and Mo 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 Molly's smiling because she knows the uh, list of recipients by heart. And can I and can see it in the box as soon as we're done here. Um, I think in terms of the specific specificity of this funding, the legislature appropriated the money specifically to do this. So it, it's it's not like we're having the pros and cons discussion relative to our base funding because we were not given the money unconditionally into the HETF. The money was specific to this purpose pursuant to a specific request that was in the context of economic stimulus given the moment we're in. So I, 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 don't, I, don't, a, I don't think there's that much choice about whether or not to do it with this funding because of the conditions the legislature put on it. But secondly, it's very specifically identified as a stimulus program um, given, given how it was framed and how it was moved through the legislature as part of the economic stimulus package uh, relating directly to the COVID-19 economic recovery. Um, I think sort of finally, the way that we framed the, uh, and the, Molly and Rebecca have walked you through the sort of larger projects, smaller projects program. We, we are proposing that ratio in, you know, specifically to make sure that we're providing opportunities that work for different kinds of places. So part of protecting a share of it for the smaller investments was to make sure that smaller communities have the ability to continue to utilize the program with great ease. I mean, one of the benefits of the smaller grants is that they have less sort of overhead work with us than larger threshold dollars. So having the continued availability of sort of two sizes, we believe will help with the regional diversity issue in a way that's very meaningful. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, think, we're thinking quite hard about how to do outreach. You know, CML has had a huge amount of interest in this program and is like, uh, <laughs> Chop it, chop it at the bit to do outreach to make sure that the their members all know about this. I think you know we obviously want to work with CCI to do the same. You know, I think the reality is that not all programs are equally um, kind of focused on cities and counties. You could argue that our uh, we have other programs that are a little more focused on counties. This one probably does have a little bit more of a cities and towns bent, and you know. I think they would, they would argue that the formula distribution in general is more weighted towards counties. So, you know, we're, ne we're, ne we're never going to resolve all of those issues, nor, nor will we get very far trying. But I, you know, I do, I do think that making sure that all of the government entities understand eligibility will be you know, a, a project and an opportunity once this goes out. And we're really thinking hard about how to do that outreach. And there's also other government entities that have found ways to use this. I think we worked with uh, CSU received some of these funds for their campus, right? They did, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, just, just just a few observations about the this, this specific program uh, relative to the world of COVID nineteen. Well, thanks so much for that. Um, and I've got Commissioner Zink and then Commissioner Brackey still on the queue. Well, just to be redundant at this point, I think the program is right sized and and um, and as it's been described, it seems to be working very well. But I I appreciate uh, Commissioner Beatty always reminding us that uh, you know what's our principal um, reason for being, and um, if you can't get to the city, you're not going to appreciate the downtown. So <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Mr. Brackey. 
Sure, and, and I'll be quick. A lot of this has, has been said. I think it's a really important program. And I think just as the conversation we were having earlier when we first started our discussion, there's examples of how these projects have been deployed in, in cities and towns of all sizes across the state. And I was just looking at the website for revitalizing uh, and safer main streets. That would, again, we were talking about how to get the information out. I think CDOT is that technical resource of saying, here's some examples of the project. There's some great maps there already, but to, to be able to show now that projects have been put in place in all of these different contexts and be able to show photos of that and examples on the CDOT website, I think would help people see there, there could be an example for them, whether it's the example that um, uh, Commissioner Vasquez was raising earlier around a two-lane condition versus a more urban condition versus a you know county example. I, I think it just helps inspire people to see the breadth of types of projects that this funding can go to support. And again, when I think about it, it ties directly back to our Vision Zero safety goals and also supports the economic vitality. So I, I think it's it's a great opportunity and again to learn from what we've done but for CDOT to be that technical resource and so many of these improvements while maybe were done as a pilot initially as Commissioner Gifford said many of them are going to live on and continue to be supported by the the community and help people be willing to try new things that we wouldn't before so again it's all a balance but I really like the idea of CDOT being a um, technical resource for local communities of all sizes. So thank you for all the work. Well, thank you for all the comments. It sounds like you've got good support here. Um, I'm gonna go back to Commissioner Beatty in just one second, but wanted to remind us that we have this as a resolution tomorrow for action. And when action is taken on this, how soon is the rollout then? I understand there'll be a press release and a launch event. When do you think that will happen? Likely as soon as the bill is signed, which could be, it could be it could be as soon as the end of the week. All right, thank you, Commissioner B. Did you want to wrap this up for us? Yeah, just again, I, I want to still voice my support of of the program as it's been been done and and implemented. Um, my concern is just trying to carve out additional funding out of our our ongoing funding to to continue a program that. We do already have transportation alternatives uh, funding that communities can apply for. I don't know if they would be able to be used exactly for what this program has done, but we do have other funding that is done through grant processes on a regular basis um, to do, you know, bike, pedestrian infrastructure and things through communities. Um, I know our communities had applied for those in the past for sidewalks and other improvements through a community. So. My concern is just when we don't have enough funding to maintain our system and trying to expand what we're doing when we don't have enough funding to do our core responsibility. It's just my base, base point I wanted to share with the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the conversation on this and all the hard work. And Molly, you've smiled the whole time, so you must love this project. Um, uh, it's These are the kinds of things that make us excited. I think even though we have all this other stuff as well, it's a, uh, an infusion of goodwill and some money that communities can really use right now in a situation that none of us have control over. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And uh, our next item is uh, the bus staying workshop. And I'm gonna ask that we take a break until five minutes after three in order for people to get up from their computers, walk around a little bit and have a health break. So if everyone is all right with that, I'm calling it as a break until 3.05. Thanks very much, everyone.
Okay, looks like it's 3.05, and if everybody's back, um, let's go ahead and take, the, there we go, uh, go ahead and uh, take this back uh, into the commission meeting, workshop meeting, and uh, the next item on our agenda is Mustang Workshop with uh, Mike Timlin and Kay Cowley. Thanks so much. We're looking forward to this one. Thank you, Chair Stewart. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna provide a few brief comments before I hand things over to Mike Timlin, who's gonna go through the presentation for us. Um, so we're, we're bringing an idea to you today that we've been brainstorming on for some time now. Uh, we've talked a lot lately about our mobility vision along the I-25 corridor with the mobility hubs, with center loading stations, with buses that are traveling in the managed lanes as a way to offer a travel time advantage over you know, personal vehicles traveling general purpose lanes. And you know, this is really a nice way to address VMT and emissions and greenhouse gases and also just offer an attractive mobility option and alternative to the single occupant vehicle status quo. Um, so, and you know, really an opportunity to provide the traveling public with some choice as well. And, and today we're, we're bringing you an idea for the I-70 mountain corridor um, that would address all of those same objectives for VMT and emissions and congestions and greenhouse gases along with a few other things like uh, workforce sh um, shortages that we're experiencing right now for commercial drivers, which you're gonna hear more about at the workshop tomorrow. Um, we're also excited for how this could feed into possible traffic mitigation measures during the upcoming Floyd Hill construction, which Paul Gisaitis and his team talked about earlier as well, along with how it might feed into some of these interagency objectives around overcrowding and capacity management at some of our recreation areas and trailheads and, and really the safety implications that we see from that when you know people are parking on the shoulders for miles and miles when their favorite trailhead parking lot is full. So you know if you haven't heard the term microtransit before, um, you've heard it a couple times already today, um, what we're talking about is essentially using something smaller than the traditional coach style bus to provide more point to point service for people. And um, we're trying to be careful not to confuse that term with micro mobility. Um, which is really more about smaller than car sized vehicles, things like scooters. So we're not talking about scooters on I-70, <laughs> not in the mix, we're talking about small buses. Um, so, but again, this micro tra transit option is something that we think is really innovative and we're looking forward to hearing your questions on this, um, incorporating your feedback prior to coming back to talk to you um, about a potential decision uh, next month. So. Um, for those of you who don't know Mike Timlin, um, Mike is our Senior Manager of Mobility Operations within DTR. Um, he's been an integral part of the successful launch of our Bustang and Outrider services over the last several years. Um, he's been at CDOT for a while now, but prior to that, he had a very long and successful career at Greyhound. Um, Mike ha has also graciously agreed to step in on an interim basis while we're looking for our permanent replacement for the Director of the Division and Trans of Transit and Rail. So I'm grateful to him for really wearing this additional hat for, you know, developing this concept. He was really the lead on developing this concept. And uh, I've talked long enough, so I'm going to hand it over to the, to the real expert. Mike, you can take it away. Thank you, Kay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Most of you, some of you, if you haven't heard, as Kay had mentioned, if you have not heard of microtransit, it is being used quite a bit around the country. Uh, usually it's uh, uh, the successful ones, uh, projects have been operated uh, by private uh, profitable carriers. Um, and usually it's by contracting with uh, traditional transit agencies uh, to be used as the uh, first and last mile choice to get people where they want to go. Uh, what we're saying here, and this is, let's make it actually the actual uh, transit uh, choice for people. <clears throat> Next slide. So we're proposing the, uh, calling this the Mountain Corridor Micro Transit Service. So uh, first and foremost, it is public transit service on the I-70 corridor, and we've targeted to be between Avon and Denver, augmenting the existing bus tank service on peak travel days primarily, uh, which are Fridays to Sundays and holidays. Also uh, targeting that uh, 
uh, period uh, between uh, mid-December and after the after New Year's, um, where is usually a daily a daily issue on the uh, mountain corridor. Um, the result would provide hourly headways um, or departures by directional using a fleet of new passenger vans configured into 14 passenger seating uh, plus driver. Uh, the vans are less than 25 feet in length and will be able to operate in the uh, mountain express lanes. Um, we've targeted the initial service uh, to be between Avon and uh, and uh, Denver Union Station with stops at Vail, Frisco, and the RTD Federal Center Station. Uh, as service and revenue grow and new funding availability is, is identified, uh, we believe that additional front range destinations like uh, Douglas County, Lone Tree, uh, Boulder, um, Westminster, Thornton would all benefit from this same thing and service could be uh, easily uh, uh, started out of the, you know, operated out of those and including going beyond Avon where statewide, I see possibilities, we see possibilities in, from Grand Junction to Durango for this type of, of regional transit. Um, I'm going to address the uh, uh, I'm going to address the private shuttles right away because uh, people are going to say, "Oh boy, you're going to you're you're going to uh, compete with the mountain shuttle carriers." Well, I have uh, talked to our friends at uh, um, at uh, Epic Mountain Express, Colorado Mountain Express, um, and they do they do agree uh, that we're not serving the same customer. On the on the uh, on the on the corridor, they're concentrating on uh, the uh, uh, those that fly into D Denver International Airport um, and want, you know and and transport them out to the uh, out to their resort uh, as quickly as possible and expeditiously as possible. They do a wonderful job. They're a very important element in the corridor's transportation inf infrastructure. Uh, we, on the other hand, uh, we're going to stick with what we do best and that's taking uh, uh, Coloradans up and down the corridor from where they need to go to where they, uh, you know, from their home to, the, you know, to their where they need to go. Um, I also propose with them that we have a collaboration frequently, maybe an association where we meet every couple months or something and talk about issues and they're very open to that. Um, and of course, we have a very ag aggressive launch date of mid-December mid, uh, 21 uh, in an effort to be a viable player uh, in the uh, uh, post-pandemic uh, world uh, for people making uh, their transportation choices. Okay, next slide. So our purpose is to uh, operate frequent, reliable, affordable peak period I-70 public transit frequent hourly service in both directions to allow riders freedom of movement fast and reliable we'll be able to use the the uh, mountain express lanes uh, flexible we'll be able to adjust schedules and routes as needed uh, affordable we'll, we we're proposing a, a public transit type fare structure connected capitalize on our connections to the local uh, public transit systems you know, along the corridor from RTD out to out to uh, even Avon Transit. Um, safety using professional drivers in the corridor could be nothing but uh, a positive uh, for uh, um, <clears throat> for the uh, for the corridor. Uh, ultimately, to reduce reliance on private automobiles and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Next. <clears throat> Why vans? Um, there's a severe CDL driver shortage and there's uh, experts don't believe that that's gonna get better anytime soon. You do not need a CDL to drive vans uh, as long as they don't seat more than uh, a driver and 14 passengers. Uh, typically liability insurance and maintenance are cheaper. Um, as we already said, they can operate in the uh, Mountain Express lanes 
uh, the vans average about 15 to 20 miles per gallon versus five miles per gallon uh, with a 45 foot motor coach. Uh, and there's lower fleet acquisition costs. As you see at the visualization at the bottom there, we can buy five to six of these of the of these vans uh, compared to one uh, 51 seat bus. <clears throat> so our next slide. <clears throat> so we offer this uh, service as proof of concept, starting small, grow as a service matures, <clears throat> more frequency, uh, more destinations as as it as it becomes more popular. <clears throat> Excuse me. Demonstrate ridership for possible potential future mass transit options. Reduce traffic and greenhouse gas emissions. Maintain a sustainable operation. Plan for 40% fare box recovery, but maintain at least 20% fare box recovery and do it by mid 2020 2022. Um, Operate, uh, operating a strict reservation only fixed route station to station, keeping operating costs low, which is what people are asking us to do uh, on that corridor. Uh, and of course, collaborate, continue collaboration with the Mount Resort shuttles. Uh, increasing uh, person trip capacity on the corridor by more than doubling the seating capacity on the peak traffic days to 744 seats per day uh, and uh, be responsive to the public desire for service. Next slide. So this is a list of our stakeholder and advisory committee. Um, we've gotten great support. Uh, from the I-70 Coalition TDM Committee uh, and the I-70 Collaborative Effort. And in fact, several of the members on the I-70 Coalition and Collaborative Effort are members of our newly created Transit and Rail Micro Transit Advisory Subcommittee. We've already had about, we've had three meetings already and uh, they were very instrumental in helping us put this presentation together. Um, the other stakeholders that in the corridor that uh, We'd like to mention this is not all inclusive, of course. Um, there's a there's few more than this. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, so our proposed fleet um, is we're we're proposing to purchase 11. 14 passenger vans custom, uh, customized so that we put upgraded seating and amenities uh, just like we did with Bustang. Um, operate with a clean turbo diesel or eco gasoline engine for now um, with estimated fuel economy of 15 to 20 miles per gallon. Currently, there are no battery electric options at this time. However, um, with these uh, vehicles having a six year um, having a, a six year uh, useful life at turnover time, we propose to uh, transition to battery electric at that at that time. And of course, um, you know, the prices, current prices are very similar with the ones that uh, with the on the vans that we're looking at to purchase. Um, and it will require a bid process. So that's why we're kind of coming to you very early. Um, and for our wheelchair uh, except uh, uh, wheelchair customers uh, will also purchase two wheelchair accept accessible vans uh, through our current state price agreement. So the capital cost for all 13 vehicles is 1.3 million. Next slide. This is a little background to show you busting uh, on the West Line on how we've done over the years. Um, in 2019, uh, the West Line handled over 71,000 riders on only three daily round trips, which averaged out to 193 passengers per day over a year. Uh, uh, <clears throat> In peak winter recreation season, we averaged over 300 per day in that 
period of time. Uh, in the late 2018, early 2019, uh, our um, contractor, Ace Express Coaches, uh, had had a uh, attrition for uh, several drivers left for higher paying positions at other transit entities. Uh, RTD was one of them and caused a six month cancellation of one round trip on the West Line with and leaving us with only two round trips uh, during that period from October through to May. Um, that resulted in hundreds of riders being left behind. This lack of seat availability and high seat load factors uh, caused customer loyalty to su suffer. Um, that that lo that's, uh, loyalty still is in question today as con customers continue to re request more service in the corridor was re reserved or guaranteed seating. On this graph you see uh, showing from when we launched in 2015 all the way up to our up through to uh, this fiscal year um, shows you the difference in there. And I think the graph shows the correlation between how we grew available seats and the growth of ridership along with that. Um, you see that in the 2017-18, you'll see that in the December, January, where our, uh, de our, the demand, our ridership was tamped down because we just didn't have available seats to, uh, uh, for the public. But in 2019, we did. 2019-2020, we did. Um, it's also evident on the graph, shows the effects of the pandemic on ridership uh, from July 2020 to January 2021. Uh, you'll note that ridership is, uh, has been kind of flat, kind of fixed at around uh, 2,000 a month. Uh, this is actually the effect of uh, strict capacity management uh, that we've uh, maintained on the West Line ridership. Uh, mandated by uh, CDPHE's uh, uh, onboard social distancing, allowing only a maximum of 21 passengers uh, on a 51 passenger seat bus. Uh, we used one piece of good news with that. Uh, we did use uh, the Better As Canada flexible reservation system of which bus staying, if I, in uh, this past October, 2020, uh, we, we received an Innovative Solutions Award for using that. Um, the flexible reservation system allows passengers to select their seats and allowed passengers to make free changes uh, on their own to their itinerary as their plans did change. Uh, they, that was very appreciated by them. Uh, also, we are not currently offering weekend Mustang services on the route, which are typically very popular with the leisure travelers. <clears throat> so in essence, we've been at, uh, uh, we've been operating maximum allowable ridership uh, for most of the months already that we've been back since uh, uh, we returned to service uh, in with the pandemic. And totally uh, Bustang ridership accounts for over 50% of the total uh, Bustang system. Next slide. So here's the kind of the proposed shuttle schedule um, on peak weekends. Uh, we're showing, uh, you know, the uh, bus staying is in, embedded in the, uh, uh, within the, uh, the micro transit system. Uh, my apologies for using the term Pegasus. That was actually an internal code word that we used for it. So, uh, it's it still is micro transit. So, um, so we are proposing that uh, we increase the bus staying to one additional trip out to Grand Junction uh, by the end of the year, which will which will increase our daily seat count to 408, uh, and then add in inner inner put, putting in 12 uh, Pegasus trips, uh, adding to 744 seats that can be sold during the day, which if, if you can read, it's not very clear on there, but we're looking at, uh, uh, I think it comes up there, uh, which uh, um, comes up to hourly service uh, between 6.30 and 6 and 6.30 in the morning up to nine o'clock at night. Next slide. 
Fares. Okay, so we 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 reevaluated the fare system that we have on bus day, keeping in mind that 17 cents a mile we use on bus day. Uh, that's for unreserved seating. Um, the fares we're, we're looking at a reservation basis with guaranteed seats. Uh, we're looking at adding three cents a mile to that to 20 cents a mile. Uh, it only makes a minor difference. Um, so the examples would be from Avon Vale would be $20 versus 17 for bus staying. Uh, Frisco to Denver, 14 and Avon Vale to Frisco, $5. Um, you can, we will allow people to use during the week. Um, uh, they can use the tickets on the regular bus staying, but it would not uh, it would not be used on a uh, as a reservation type seat on bus staying. Um, we see this as a plus uh, for the recreational travel on there because we'll be also offering, you know, our usual 20, uh, yeah, 10, 20, and 40 ride seats. People can use these on the weekends to go up to their uh, favorite recreation resort if they so choose um, and get a discount. So at that point, if they bought a 40 ride pass, you know, each trip becomes 15 bucks one way. Um, so to Vail, that's pretty, pretty cheap, 30 bucks a uh, round trip. Next, there you go. So here's the uh, capital and re capital costs, estimated cost. The 11 passenger vans would be uh, 54, uh, you know, about $54,000 a piece, total of about uh, somewhere around, you know, 50, uh, 50. 594,000. Uh, customizing them uh, would be about 40,000 a piece to put upgrading seats and um, uh, and then buying two wheelchair accessible vans would be 65,000 um, and adding our uh, uh, at CAD AVL system in there so that we could uh, the drivers are in contact always with uh, the dispatch center and be able to get automated uh, computer computer assisted dispatch and uh, and have the vehicle tracked. So about nine thousand a, a unit. So so the the cost comes up to about one point three million in upfront capital costs. And of course, our plan is for forty percent fare box recovery, but maintain a twenty percent fare box recovery by mid twenty twenty two. So operations and maintenance costs. Our assumptions here, um, and this is what our cost per vehicle revenue mile, the micro transit was kind of on the low end, $2.40 to $2.75 on a high end uh, based on not knowing what some of the variable costs would be, but that would be a high and low. Uh, Bustang today is $4.35 uh, per mile. Don't Please don't confuse this with cost per Passenger mile, uh, obviously a 51 seat bus is far more economical on a passenger mile basis than these vehicles would be. Um, we're, we're assuming 136 annual operating days, uh, 465,000 annual operating miles. Uh, there's gonna be some ho hotel nights for the drivers, uh, even though uh, the plan is to recruit half the drivers in the mountain communities and the other half on the front range. Um, and I, we used a uh, fuel economy between $2 and 50 cents a gallon to $4 a gallon on the high end. And you can see, and, uh, uh, you can see that the, uh, on this, uh, uh, graph that, uh, the annual operating cost analysis runs from a million dollars on the low end annually to, uh, 1.23 million on the high end. Uh, we do, thanks to the, uh, uh, stimulus funds that came our way, uh, we'll be able to cover uh, the bus staying operation and ma maintenance budget without any additional uh, without any additional funds. Next slide. Um, communications plan. We're going to be very aggressive in our communications of this service so we get the word out. Uh, we do want to choose the permanent service name and livery 
uh, that that uh, by the late spring of, of this year, uh, press release, social media, uh, and media coverage from the from all of the uh, local Denver news channels all the way up through to uh, Summit and, and Eagle County. Next slide. Governance. Uh, uh, this is just to show uh, the commission that uh, um, uh, TC resolution 3133 back that was passed back in uh, uh, January 2014 already uh, provides the uh, provision to monitor Mustang's success for the first three years of operation with authority to continue service, modify or cancel, uh, depending on uh, you know, depending on how the service performs. And then along with those, the uh, policy directive 1605.1, which was approved in August 2014, established reporting procedures to the uh, Transportation Commission, which uh, continues to this day. Next slide. So our next steps, uh, hopefully if you, if the commission agrees, we hope to come to you next month uh, for a resolution to, to move forward with it. If that's the case, we will we want to order the fleet by late April, uh, finalize brand name and vehicle livery by mid-May, mid um, and then start our stakeholder outreach in May uh, through to July on 2021. And with that, uh, I welcome questions and comments from the uh, commissioners. Great presentation, Great presentation, Mike. We appreciate it. Um, looks like we have Commissioner Gifford, then Beatty, then Stanton. I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is obviously a, a, only a small minority of these vans are going to accommodate um, people in wheelchairs. And I'm wondering what percentage of the users of Bustang at this point have, have accessibility requirements. Um, and, and how are we going to hand, handle that exactly? Are we going to say like this? you know, certain time slots are going to accommodate um, people in wheelchairs or what? And then I have a second question after that, but I think I should probably let you answer this one first. Well, our, our good question. Our experience is that about 1% of our riders are, you know, using wheelchairs. Uh, we're, we're very confident by, you know, using uh, statistics from our uh, peer operators that we can do this adequately People can will be able to reserve a, uh, you know, reserve their seat on a van on an accessible van, at their leisure at the time that that they want to go. But it's going to be oh okay, so they're not because we'll have, have two of them, okay. and we'll have them, and the, each van can do more than one one person. So if we get two or three, okay. we can get two or three on there and get them to where they're going. And then I, I think maybe this is just a first draft, and I I'm just being picky, but the Vail to Denver price is sort of set at 20 and then Vail to Frisco is five, Frisco to Denver is 14. So I would buy like multiple one-way tickets on shorter hops, it sounds like, to get the lowest price. I don't think that's intentional, is it? No, it's not intentional, but it, it may happen that way. Um, it's, it's a good point. So you, you save a buck by doing it that way. Somebody's going to do that. <laughs> I'm sure they will. You're right. Anyway, just curious. That's it. But that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Beatty. Yeah, I had a couple. Um, on the funding for this, um, have you talked to the resorts or anything that uh, they would kick in to help kind of offset some of the ongoing costs of replacements and things with this sort of service? Or would this just come out of the transit dollars out of CDOT entirely? Or would there be partners that would be kicking in to help run this service? Um, good good point. Um, right now with our snow stank service, we do have three resorts that are uh, kicking in money for the snow stank service to make it a uh, cost neutral uh, proposition and we plan to resurrect that next year. This one we're just we're going to start it's not 
um, it's not going to be targeted to the resorts, but that doesn't mean that later on we couldn't pivot and start doing that if everyone was in agreement that that was a thing to do. And yes, um, you know, we're constantly uh, figuring out how we can get, you know, how we can get uh, the uh, the uh, resort community involved and and active in it. And um, it, I, you know, it's really something that uh, we can consider, sure. But to start, it's basically on, it's just basically our funds that we're looking to uh, prove the, the uh, proof of concept of the, of the success for it. Okay. Um, and then on the customization cost, um, is that just primarily the upgraded seating in those vans or adding the seating? Is that primarily the cost or what all is in the customization? Yeah, well, that's one of them. It's upgrading the seats. Um, it's uh, you know putting um, uh, you know putting uh, uh, drop down chains on the uh, you know so that we wouldn't have to be doing chain chaining up um, stuff like you know uh, stuff like that you know putting uh, the Wi Fi on there and so that people could use Wi Fi um, all the little amenities co cost right. you know cost money so um, that's why it looks kind of out of whack but it really is kind of in it's really within the, you know, we figured it would be about $100,000 a, a vehicle to, to buy. So after, after you put all the package of stuff in there. Yeah. Um, how many years do you think the buses would last for an average lifespan for these vans? Uh, six years. Six, six years. years is what they're, yeah, that's what they're calculated by FTA. Okay. They have a six year useful life. And, and if you then, maintain and then, it properly, you could maybe get squeeze one or more years out of them. Right. Uh, and then just looking at the prices like Epic Mountain Express that you showed, um, their base price going from DIA to Avon is $75 a rider. Um, yes. So we are at a substantial discount to that. Um, I'd like to see us initially have the goal of a minimum of 20% fare box return. I would like to see in the resolution that we would strive to reach a 40% when we're able to run it at capacities. Um, right. Obviously that's partly based on how many riders you get in each van, but I, I think that's a goal we as CDOT should do as we've seen with Bustang, having that much higher fare return compared to a lot of other transit agencies. And I think that's what will help keep this this moving forward, if we can show that kind of fair return, I think it's much easier to sell to the public and keep them buying into expanding these types of services. If they see that the people that are using them are actually helping pay um, a larger share of it, um, especially, I know some commuters will be workers, but a lot of going to the mountain communities especially are gonna be uh, people going for recreation and looking for a cheaper, more leisurely way to travel rather than having to drive themselves and fight the traffic and, and things. So I think especially the mountain corridors are one where we have that ability to possibly use the marketability and the market that we're serving to get that higher fare return. So I guess, I don't know if we can put that into a resolution when we come to the point of approving, but that we're striving to reach a 40% trying to stay at a, a minimum of a 20% to keep it going. Well, it, 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 all, it is, uh, it's already in, it's already codified in the uh, policy directive that we have to maintain. Uh, we have to get to a 20% fare box recovery within three years. Um, we're saying we can do it, we can get 20% by the middle of 2022. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Have Commissioner Stanton and Adams. Thanks, Chair Stewart. Hey, Mike and team, that was a really exceptional brief. I appreciate the thoroughness. And I appreciate your going back to 2014 uh, TC governance to give us the policy basis of all this. I wondered if we could just step back. And this has something to do with uh, what Commissioner Beatty said. You know, we're Obviously, the ski corridor has the most volume, but if we step back and look at the state, 
where else could CDOT help? And I'm thinking about rural hospitals. I'm thinking about underserved areas where vans could be used on the Western Slope or on the Eastern uh, side of the state, specifically uh, bringing people to uh, the VA hospital. You know, there's, there's clinics, VA clinics in Pueblo and Colorado Springs, but I don't know if you've looked at that as maybe a secondary tranche. And I think from a basis of equity, CDOT should look strongly at not just, you know, where the, the people and skis are. And I, I'll just share, you know, I don't know, skiers can get to ski areas. Uh, and I know we're trying to get people off the road, but I don't, uh, kind of back to Commissioner Beattie, I don't want to subsidize skiers. Thank you. I, I, I absolutely, absolutely uh, understand your feeling on that. Uh, yes, um, I see uh, this kind of micro transit used very effectively uh, on the Eastern Plains, bringing people, you know, from, you know, from, uh, you know, rural communities on smaller vehicles into the VA hospital or even into the, you know, Anschutz Medical Center, if, uh, you know, depending on where they're going. Uh, uh, I could see it on the Western Slope, um, bringing people to the uh, VA hospital from all the, the little, from the towns along there in Montrose, um, yeah, Montrose Parachute, um, all along there, bringing them into the VA hospital in uh, Grand Junction and St. Mary's Hospital, which is the big hospital in, uh, you know, on the Western Slope. Uh, Durango, I mean, Durango is a perfect example, you know, from uh, Pagosa Springs into uh, Durango and, uh, uh, you know, service from, you know, uh, Cortez to uh, uh, Durango. Uh, I see this as the, uh, uh, just a start for us. Mike? Don't you talk about the ones we already have coming? We already have those bus services on the West Slope. Well, I'm talking about. Uh, I know you're talking you about these micro buses, but I right. make sure Commissioner Stanton knows we already have some services from on, on the Western Slope bringing people into the VA. Sure, but this this gives you uh, yes, and I that's absolutely right. And we are adding service uh, outrider, and uh, uh, you know we hope to add bus more bus tank service out to the Western Slope later this year. Um, but this would be, this would all, you know, this would uh, serve the communities that aren't on the, on the route of the Bustang Outrider. This could be used, um, you know, Gunnison into Grand Junction, for instance. Um, uh, we plan, do plan to put up, put an Outrider service in between Montrose and, uh, uh, and Gunnison very soon, but I, this, this could be used very effectively all over the state. I appreciate Commissioner Hall's point. I was just looking at maybe shifting to Eastern Colorado and Commissioner Beatty knows this better, but there's probably some needs out there. And as rural hospitals under, are under such stress, I just wonder if there might be a way uh, to serve them and to serve the veterans that are strung out in some of these smaller towns. Thank you. Yeah, that actually is, uh, that is on our, our uh, uh, we are actually looking at that. We have done, we've done studies. Uh, there's a, there's a demand for transit that uh, we can't afford to, to you know, for uh, down in San Luis Valley to uh, the VA center in Denver, for instance, we have looked at that. Um, uh, you know, we're going to be starting service uh, out of um, Sterling here later on this year, uh, where two days a week it'll be coming into Denver. Um, unfortunately, because of the, the length of the distance, uh, we can't stop there at, uh, you know, we could stop at the Peoria station in Denver and make an easy connection to uh, the uh, VA from there. Uh, but I think, you know, micro transit, if you had enough people in, um, you know, one, in, if you had four or five veterans in, um, and make a, make, a, make a route from maybe central, you know, from 
you know, south of Sterling in the communities, like in Yuma or a place like that, you get, and you just make a day where they can all get into the VA hospital in a day with a 14 passenger van that would be very comfortable to ride. Um, that would be helpful too. And I, I do want to put a, take a, I have a shout out to uh, NECALG and uh, the East, East ECOG out there that operates very, very good uh, senior and uh, 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 demand response service out there also. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience, Commissioner Adams, you're up. Uh, Mike, I'd also like to uh, uh, say thank you for, the, for for bringing this to uh, to us. I, I have a couple of uh, a couple of statements and concerns about it that I'd like to just register. One is, you know, if this were more of a straight out commercial endeavor, I, I guess I'd expect to see a lot more of the marketing from the ultimate consumer standpoint, which would be from the, the point of view of the people in, De in the metro area who, or wherever they would be coming from, who'd actually use this service. Now, other than seeing Dr. Cog and maybe RTD on your list, I didn't really get the sense that, <clears throat> that I saw a lot of the Denver representation I, as opposed to the representation from people in the mountain communities. So, so I would have liked to have seen more of that. And so maybe you'll tell me that there's a, a deep, rich, robust kind of market study that, like you guys used to do at Greyhound uh, that, that I would have been able to see. So that's one comment I'd make. The other is, I guess I sort of feel like this feels more like it's, it's look, I don't disagree with the notion of reducing vehicle miles driven. I think that is a, and safely and, and adding to our safety by having fewer people on the road. So I buy all of that. I, I guess I would just, I, I'm not as happy about subsidizing skiers even at 40% recovery of fare box or, or, or and, I, and I'm not thrilled at all about 20%, but I understand the economics for what we're trying to do here. But, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't go up that way myself very often anymore. But, uh, but anything we can do to re reduce the corridor, I guess, and I don't think a million three for these buses seems to be all that expensive to me. So I don't really look at that as being necessarily costly. So I could easily get there and be supportive of something like this. But I think I'd love to see a little bit more of the marketing data regarding the user's perspective. And in other words, are they asking for this kind of service and capability? Or is this something that we're saying we think they would like this because it'll take more cars off the road. Um, let me go back to your to your first for your first comment about stakeholders. Um, yeah, I didn't have enough room on that slide to put every stakeholder on there, but I, you know, in the Denver metro area, I can see um, uh, Metro North as a stakeholder, um, uh, South Denver. Um, uh, TMA, uh, there's you know there's groups all over that we would we would be uh, uh, all over the Met Denver metro area that we would be uh, part that we would uh, be pre uh, presenting to. Um, your point, Mike. Just just so I'm clear, I I'm not saying that I dis disagree or dispute the notion that there are these constituencies that are likely users. I'm just saying. Before we pass on an initiative to do it, have we already gotten that input? We've gotten that input. We haven't done any real any ridership studies. We're going by the comments that we've received from the public on the corridor. That's, and, fair. And, and, That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Okay. And the other aspects of my questions, and there were a series of them, by the way. So uh, <clears throat> things like. Uh, you know, the, the feeling about, is it really competing against the guys who are already in the marketplace? Are we being, are we in effect subsidizing ski traffic that would, you know, that would ordinarily be paying substantially more than whatever the, the fare box revenue for this kind of service would be? Um, 
I can answer that by saying, it, you know, yes, it, it, would, it looks like we're, we're subsidizing the ski industry up there, but really what we're trying to do is attack the traffic on that corridor. You know, people aren't, not everybody that are going up on a Saturday morning getting stuck behind Floyd Hill or in, the, uh, you know, in, in Clear Creek County are going up to go skiing. They might be going, and I, I, it's happened to me too. I have, uh, I have relatives up in Vail that I go visit and uh, you know you just during christmas you just can't get anywhere because of the because uh, of the it's just totally congested um <clears throat> you know that I, I don't know how you can break it apart between supporting this the ski industry and just attacking the traffic that's on the corridor i haven't come up with an answer on that one yet no no i, I it's a complicated problem and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I'm opposed to the notion of reducing vehicle miles travel. I'm just trying to understand how, uh, as one commissioner, I could be, uh, and I like the initiative, don't get me wrong. I just don't know if I like it for this specific uh, activity versus something else. I mean, so, that, so I'm, I guess I'm a little bit where, where maybe Commissioner Stanton was in terms of suggesting alternate things that accomplish the same purpose of reducing the number of vehicles on the road. Sure. So, but I'm, but I am supportive of the notion of reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled. I'll, I'll turn you. it over to the next person and won't belabor it anymore on that point. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to give it to Commissioner Beatty. But if you notice in the chat box, Chief um, Engineer Harrelson said, based on I-70 Mountain Porter traffic studies, there is considerable traffic generated by ski area employees and not just customers. So just wanted to make sure that got right. into the into the um, comments section. Um, I have Commissioner Beatty, then Bracky, then Vasquez. Thanks for waiting, everyone. Thank you. Um, just wanted to follow up on Don's comments about um, getting people to hospitals and things in the front range. One thing our local hospital does, they have the doctors come out here for a lot of the visits so people don't even have to go to the city. They have the special, specialty doctors that come to our local hospitals. Um, I think that's a model that's much better for all the patients to have one person and one or two staff maybe come to the local hospitals and they can schedule and do all those things. It gets much right. more difficult to get a van full of eight to 10 people to get scheduled to go to one hospital in the city. So um, our transit agencies, um, Outback Express is the one that serves my area. They do scheduled services that do uh, trips to the city and even to the local towns for people that need it for grocery shopping or shopping and even doctor visits. The doctor visits get a lot more complicated because you have to work with the doctor schedules and multiple people just complicates that very quickly to try to get a, a van full of people. So right. I always hear we need to get people to the VA hospital or to the hospitals in the cities. It's a very difficult one to do with a mass transit type type system. A lot of those need to be done like the NECAL does with vans and things. And they are able to schedule with individual people and the doctors and, and coalesce those together. It's very difficult, I think, on a statewide basis to try to do that sort of service. So I caution us trying to get into that, that detail and to use our other transit dollars with the local agencies to do those services. They're very critical, but I think it's best done through our uh, local services, NECAL, Outback Express, and all the others around the state. Um, yeah. Some perspective on that for, for feedback, so. A yeah, quick question I, on the vans. Can the transit agencies use their transit federal transit dollars to buy these vans? Or do we have to continue to buy the buses that, to tell you the truth, on these rural roads are not the most pleasant of ride in the <laughs> handicap accessible buses um, when you have the, the joints and things that, like you're on a cobblestone road and those things just shake and rattle to no end. These vans, I think, would be a lot more conducive if we could use the federal dollars to buy these vans. Yeah, actually, 
actually commissioner they those those vans are there they qualify as by america and would uh, uh and and would be up, they would be eligible for uh to be purchased with federal funds i guess i'd encourage you to let the transit agencies know that out here that these type of vans could replace those buses because i think they may actually get more ridership on some of these if they could uh be on a more comfortable ride on some of these rural roads that are kind of rough and at times and i think those vans would be a lot nicer riding so. i agree i'll do that thank you thank you i'd like to interrupt the queue here to let director Lou in. she's uh she's going to comment and then after her we'll go back to the queue which is commissioner bracky and then vasquez thanks Thank you so much. Appreciate letting me jump in. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. I think one is that I want to draw the connection between this and the conversation we had earlier about Floyd Hill, um, because I think one of the reasons we're taking up this conversation now is that part of the theory of the case is mitigation of vehicular miles traveled impacts for doing a major construction project that includes the adding, adding of a managed land um, onto the system in that area. And I think we were envisioning you know, one of the things that I think increasingly is part of the conversation, you think of the US 36 model is making sure that when we add capacity to roads, we are sort of similarly thinking about how we build in multiple modes of transportation to use those services and change the demand habits. And there's sort of no time like the beginning to put that in place. So I actually think that there's importance relative to thinking about mitigation for the Floyd Hill project to doing this at the, at the sort of outset of that conversation so that we start to, um, Get this in service to to, to sort of pave, pave the way, pun intended, for the managed lanes to be transit lanes as well as car lanes. Um, and you know, I I, th I think we could probably debate in a perfect world who would be the provider of this particular service. But we all know that it crosses jurisdictions of a number of the different local authorities. It's probably not going to happen unless we, as the connector of those different authorities, at least get it off the ground. You know, I, I, would, I would love to get into a space where sometimes we incubate things and then they don't live here forever. Um, but I, ju I just think that it, um, in order for this to happen on the timeline, where it will be meaningful as mitigation for the large construction project, that's you know, a priority for us, but nonetheless, you know, we'll, we'll have some environmental impacts that we need to deal with and that the stakeholders in the area, you know, particularly Clear Creek County are very concerned about um, regarding thoughtfully you know, it's, it's important to have it integrated um, in that matter. And, you know, I also think that the number of dollars we're talking about sort of fits into the band of what we've treated as project mitigation in the past for other projects. If you look at the things, you know, I hate to use Central 70 because it's not the best example given how many things got, um, got, got kind of added in, probably not in the, as, you know, not, not in the manner where we were thinking about it from the front end. And I think part of our thought is that if you think thoughtfully about mitigation at the beginning of a project, it's actually more cost effective than if you, you know, keep the can and have those conversations at the end when you're just trying to get, get clearance on an environmental review. So, you know, I, 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 I think we have to think about it as having incremental benefit in that respect too. Um, I also think that there's, you know, whether it's the federal funds or, you know, potential future funds that could come in through um, state means uh, you know, that, that are, that are you know, what we're, hear we're hearing about as sort of potentially legislative or other, you know, the odds are that there's a, a number of different kind of funding sources for various forms of transit, you know, in, in the hopper right now, including some of the ones that we have. And I think we have to look at what has, you know, the maximum ROI, not just what we've always done before. And, you know, re relating back to our conversation about multimodal hubs before, you know, I I I, th I think there's sort of an open question: what would impact people more? Um, you know, a, a a piece of the increment we're talking about here to do this service, or adding another two million dollars to a multimodal hub, and you know, building a parking lot as part of a project. And you know, it's it's all kind of comparing um, in, impact of apples to oranges and the many funds that we have for various forms of transit and multimodal specifically. So I I, I actually think this is an important one for all of those reasons. Thanks for your thanks for your input, Director Lou. Um, we're going to go now to uh, Commissioner Brackey and then uh, Commissioner Vasquez. Great, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in. And and um, Executive Director Lou, I agree with so many of the points that that you made in terms of 
um, the importance of this type of project in and of itself, the timing of it is, is important. And I think the role of CDOT, it, it's important that, um, as you said, there's no one else in the space to provide interregional transit. And so, I mean, there are some, there are ex examples, but the idea is it's a complementary set of service providers and CDOT has a role in that space. And so I do think it is important for us to not only be building the infrastructure, whether it's the highway and the managed express lanes and the mobility hubs, but we need to be developing the programs and services to optimize the use of that capital infrastructure. And this is an example of how to optimize the use of those, those dollars. And I, I think that it's really helpful. I really appreciate the proposal that was put together that we need to be piloting new types of transit. If we keep doing transit the same way we've always done transit, we're gonna have the same mode share of transit that we have today. What we're trying to do is change that. And we're trying to help people of all ages and stages of life all over the state find different options and choices on how to travel. And oftentimes what we see is that people are willing to try transit for a recreational trip or a social trip or something like that to, to go out into the outdoors or to go skiing. And they have a positive experience using transit in that capacity and it helps them be more inclined to consider transit for other types of trip purposes in their life. So my hope is that CDOT it can continue to lead in the space and to be innovative and to bring forward these new types of um, transit options and help break the mold of what transit is and help people be able to experience transit in a lot of different ways and optimize the use. Um, I guess the other point I would like to add is that we often say, well, people are, you know, they're driving up there anyway. We have a lot of people in our communities who who don't have cars and they're trying to access our recreational trails, our trailheads, our ski resorts, a lot of places in the state. And so it gets back to the social equity conversation we were having earlier. By providing these options and choices, we're actually able to serve more people who live across our communities to be able to enjoy different parts of the state. And as was mentioned, it's not just recreational trips, it's work trips, access to jobs, access to healthcare, access to education. So I think it is a good um, program that we should move forward with and we should move forward with it at this point in time, again, to get ahead of the construction that's coming and help people find options and choices sooner rather than later. So um, that's my two cents. I guess the other thing I would add based on experience from other transit operators, Yes, fare box recovery is an important performance measure, no doubt, money matters, but there's a lot of other performance metrics that are human-centered, and if we could add performance metrics that are from around social equity, around customer quality of customer service, did this trip help you, you know, encourage you to take transit for other trips, those types of performance measures, so it's not just solely based on fare box recovery would be my suggestion, so thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Vesquez. Yeah, thanks for this presentation. I wanna drill down a little bit into the earlier comments about the price point for uh, the trip, uh, the one way from Denver to uh, Vail, for example. Um, if you compare it to the commercial solution for the well-heeled skier, that price point is low, but if you compare it to the cost of someone who's going to a job for a single vehicle trip where they're just paying for gas and deferred maintenance, uh, it's probably a good price point. And along the, uh, the comments that were just made about social equity, you're playing three-dimensional chess here, I think. You have the desire to reduce the traffic, to provide uh, social equity, to provide uh, a price point that is achievable by people who uh, are lower in the socioeconomic uh, scale. So I think it's gonna be a great program. My only hope is that it can be successful and be expanded to uh, more destinations in rural Colorado. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll wrap this up. If you don't mind, I'd like to make a comment uh, and ask a question. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea to um, 
to give an option to people to take transit in the I-70 corridor. I'm hoping, I don't have a crystal ball, nor do any of you sitting there, but I'm hoping that people will give transit a, a, a try again and won't feel um, as concerned riding transit. I suspect that in a long trip like this, people are more ready to take transit than they are at RTD, where we see such abysmal ridership right now and an effort from RTD to try to figure out how do you how do you win back your riders? How do you get them out of their cars? Um, so that that's my one of my comments. My other comment is I can't wait to see what your logo is. Um, I see you've got Amelie in there as your uh, PR people, and I don't know whether they're going to help you with your logo or not. We've used them in the Denver Regional Council of Government's Way to Go program to do quite a bit of our stuff in, in prior years, and they're very creative. And I love the Mustang, and I love the Mustang. Can't wait to see what your new logo is. And then finally, I want to know as you customize these vehicles, are you able to put a step into the vehicles? Because I will tell you, it's very hard for many people my age and younger to climb into a van. Uh, <clears throat> difficult to get your, if, particularly if you have a D problem or a hip problem or something like that. And um, if there's an opportunity in customizing vans to be able to have some kind of a, a step so that someone doesn't have to put all that weight on a bad knee or on a, a bad hip, I think that would be beneficial. Certainly, I wouldn't need the, the wheelchair accessible, but every year that I get older, I find that I'm less I'm less uh, flexible than I was the year before. And I think there's a lot of baby boomers my age who would use your service, but may not like the van concept. It, it, uh, <clears throat> it, it's actually in our, in our uh, the, uh, the step is actually in our uh, specification. <clears throat> Yay. <laughs> I know exactly you. what you're I know I have the same problem because I had a knee replacement a year ago. Yeah, it's just too, it's too hard to put all the weight on one one knee sometimes. Well, thank right. you very much. This was really a great presentation. You see that there's a lot of interest in this, and um, we look forward to um, the the next piece of this that you'll bring to us. I see that we're behind schedule, and I also see that Commissioner Hurd is um, is joining us. I'm uh, going to ask. Uh, for your indulgence to switch out uh, the off-highway vehicle pilot program to be next and then let the policy directive 1601 go to the end if that's acceptable since we do have a, a couple of guests who are here um, specifically for the off-highway uh, vehicle pilot program. Is that acceptable with everyone? Okay, thanks very much. So um, I'll then give it over to Mike Goolsby on behalf of uh, the request from Hinsdale County. Thank you, Chair Stewart. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're back again from last month to have a conversation with all of you around the uh, uh, request from Hinsdale County and the town of Lake City to extend the OHV pilot program. Um, Jennifer, if you could, could you pull up the uh, resolution that, that lists all of the information on it? Because I'm going to have Zane go through that. But while um, that's taking place, um, I want to uh, preface it with the um, information that you all provided us in the feedback. Um, Zane went back and um, spent a considerable amount of time with the uh, County and the city um, discussing some of these things and what you all see in front of you probably in your packet and um, hopefully on the screen um, will be the, uh, the culmination of that um, and hopefully we met the intent of what you all were asking for. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Zane. Let me also say uh, really wanted to thank Commissioner Vasquez for some of her uh, point of comment. She had some pretty specific ideas, and and um, they they led to some good things, I think. So, okay, here we go. <clears throat> so basically, uh, kind of the gist of of last month was that there was a request to 
uh, sort of wordsmith the resolution to be much more specific. As you recall, the last resolution was pretty broad and it just said, okay, CDOT, you guys can, can do this how you see fit. And so the request was to just be much more specific on what we're doing, where we're doing it, what the time frame is, and then a number of the special considerations that we're going to uh, weave into this program. So Jennifer, if you could scroll down a little bit more. Uh, right about there, yeah. So uh, towards the top of that, um, we kind of changed a little bit of, of some of the wording, but as we get to right here, uh, we've got about a page, a little over a page worth of uh, very specific things. And so um, the first bullet point under the bottom, whereas we've specified exactly the time frame that this will be and exactly the limits. If we could scroll down. Jennifer, I think you need to make it a little, there you go, thanks. Yeah, that looks good. So then right here, what we've done is um, that next bullet there, we've, we've specified that the local agencies will be responsible for the sign plan uh, that, that will be developed uh, with CDOT. It'll be similar to the sign plan we have last year, but there will be a few changes. Uh, we also wove into this bullet point right here that, um, you know, once again, CDOT uh, does have the ability to terminate the program at any time um, if we feel like it's not operating as it should. And to inform that decision, uh, we're asking that if any accident occurs out there uh, with an OHV that within at least two weeks, uh, that CDOT would be notified of that incident so we could look at that and see if it's uh, resulted in any kind of injury or fatality, hopefully not a fatality, but see what the severity of that, that accident is. And if it seems like it's, you know, something that's important, we would take that to the commission um, and report that to you guys um, so, that, uh, so that we're very transparent about the safety out there since that's our biggest concern. Moving down a little bit more, um, we've specified that uh, you know, because the Alpine Loop is a connection of State Highway, City Street, County Road, and four service roads, we said that if at any time one of those entities were to uh, restrict OHV access on their roads, so if the county or the city uh, rescinded their resolutions that allow that use, that uh, this program would, would cease. So we want to make sure that was clear. Uh, the next bullet down uh, talks about the speed limit. We talked about that quite a bit last month. And so what we would do is the portion of the uh, highway that's opened OHVs, we would lower the speed limit temporarily uh, just during the OHV season um, to 30 miles an hour. Now, that was a little bit, I, I might have been able, I might have should have worded this a little bit different because the, the speed limit within Lake City is actually 25 miles an hour, and so that, that remains. What we're talking about with this bullet point is once you leave city limits, uh, the speed limit would be dropped to 30 uh, from the current 35 miles an hour that it is right now. Uh, moving down a little bit more, uh, we're just clarifying that uh, OHVs are subject to all the state rules and state traffic laws. Um, that other vehicles are, and as well as the specific laws that uh, the ordinances by Hinsdale County and, and the Town of Lake City have in their ordinances. So some of those ordinances that are special are things like uh, the insurance requirement, uh, helmets for operators, I think under 18, um, some of those kinds of things. So we wanted to make that clear. Um, next bullet point. Hinsdale County did commit to hiring an additional two uh, seasonal law enforcement officers uh, during the time of the pilot program. So um, we wanted to uh, include that in here and make sure that that's understood. Uh, Hinsdale County has committed to taking a look at their uh, current OHV ordinance 
and considering uh, increases in the fines and penalties for OHV infractions, um, that would happen, I think, in the next few months. Um, perhaps uh, Commissioner Hurd can comment on that, but um, there hasn't really been time to dive deep into that one um, just yet. So um, we'll see how that, that goes. Next bullet point, we uh, clarified some of the educational outreach um, that the local entities uh, will be going through, uh, talking about uh, making sure that maps are available, informational brochures, a lot of those kinds of things have already been done and, and were out there the last time. Uh, the volunteer manned information stops um, did occur last season as well, so we're just asking that that, that be continued. Scrolling down a little bit more, oh, right, yep, right there. Um, so we're talking about the reports that uh, we're going to ask the locals to provide. Uh, just like they did this last year, we're going to ask for a report at the end of each of the three uh, uh, pilot program seasons. It'll be similar kind of information that we saw in the current report, uh, information from law enforcement, uh, uh, information on safety, of course, uh, number of tickets, those kinds of things. Additionally, one of the things that we just haven't been able to get a real good handle on is, is OHV volumes out there. And so in working with Hinsdale County, they've committed to um, actually take OHV counts um, twice per month during the four month duration. So I think that's a really good one. That'll fill in a, a, a big data gap um, that we've had out there. So that'll be great information. And finally, um, Hinsdale County uh, is, is going to set up a link on their county website where the public can submit feedback and suggestions for the duration of the pilot program. We think this might be a good way to sort of consolidate comments and, and make it very transparent that comments are welcome. Uh, throughout the implementation of this program. So that'll be a great, uh, I think, tool to, to sort of corral some of those, those comments. So that, that is pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, Commissioner Hurd, is there anything you'd like to add or, or any other comments from you? Uh, yes, uh, Zane, I appreciate that. Uh, I would like to comment on a couple of things you've said and add a couple of other things if I could. Uh, the uh, We had a meeting today of the county commission and on the fine levels, uh, we are, most of the fines currently are enforced on the county system of the, the program and, and even on the highway part over the last two years of this program are going to be doubled. They're gonna be at least doubled, some more than doubled that we've made that commitment and we will fine tune that with our lawyer, uh, the county attorney. And we're going to, the city is also in, in on this uh, with us and we're all, the fines will be much higher for the, the various infractions, whether it's a helmet or lack of and uh, speeding. We're going to double those fines. We're going to commit to additional signage and we may, we feel like we want to create some signage out there at the at, at real uh, visual points, and actually post the signs the uh, the fine structure, so that they're not we're not counting on them to just look at at a brochure, and uh, you know that's motor vehicles never see that sort of information as far as out on highways, but we think this is important enough for them to know what happens. Uh, that we are going to post those new signs uh, uh, or the, the different uh, citation levels. And uh, I think that will be a good deterrent to keep everybody. And even though we haven't had a tremendous amount of tickets uh, and I would love the commission to understand that and hope they'll look at our, our safety level that we've had these last two years, which one non-injury accident and tickets, very minor amounts of tickets. These, these folks, uh, we feel that the substantial amount of them are riders that are seniors and handicapped people that can't get an open uh, environment up to our high country. And 
we have, I, uh, we estimate 50% of our riders on our drivers and riders on these things are some elderly folks that have no other way to, they can't hike, they can't get there. So we feel that uh, it's important that we, uh, you know, get able to get those folks up there and this small piece of highway just allows that that loop to take place. We're, we're very much concerned on being able to get those folks in a safe way up there. And we do believe that the majority in our, our two year, I, I can't, I would hope we're judged on our two year safety record from the commission. I know there's all sorts of maybes and ifs out there and, and other statistics that's been pulled in from, from all kinds of locations, but our two year program does not show that and uh, that we've had much, I don't think it'd be a blip on the screen of safety in the whole state. Uh, bicycles and everybody else seem to have a lot more uh, car and bike accidents and pedestrians even than our little piece of the highway. And we want to keep it that way and we want to lower, we want no accidents. And so uh, we feel like that our program in the last two years is, is very visible and a credit to what you know we've been able to do in safety ways and we hope we're judged on that and 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 i hope we are able to have that as as a primary thing and what happens in a far-flung area or what has happened on paper uh, you know we just feel like that this program we've had is has been a safe good program for our small community for the economy and convenience of all sorts of users of this program and we're very high on continuing it and make it safer and more solid as the years go by and anything we encounter either through the months that it's going on you know in a in a seasonal way we'll make adjustments as needed and we'll continue to to keep money into our enforcement there'll be a a law enforcement official on that highway every day all day and that's a you know on that uh, that kind of patrol i doubt that's the case in most of the colorado state highways but we will enforce all of our rules and uh, i think we can make this program even safer than it's been but we feel it's been very safe and very well done already but we're going to improve on it with all the commitments we've made in uh, in what you've put forth here to the commission zane Thank you. Thanks very much, Commissioner Hurd. Um, is there any further presentation to come in front of the uh, Transportation Commission on this, or are you ready for questions and comments? I, I believe, Commissioner, or, that we're ready for um, questions, if there are any. Um, I don't know that there was a lot um, that wasn't discussed last month. I think that was more about just giving you guys the nuts and bolts of the the, the specifics that were requested, and, and we can entertain questions. I'm... Thank you. We sure appreciate you uh, being responsive to all those comments and questions. All right, uh, Commission, anyone who... Uh, wants to uh, make any comments or have any further questions, proper time to do so now. This is Kathy. I'll be yeah, happy. I'll be, I'll be happy to make some comments. Um, I, I certainly um, stand with everything I said last time. And I want to make sure that uh, a question, because I was very adamant about thinking that it was a really good program for this particular community. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unusual community. And um, because I've made such strong comments about it, there was a question that came from that area that did I, was I related to someone who was in business in, in, in Lake City or did I have some connections there? And, and I don't, I don't have any, I, you know, the friends that I've had there in the past have all moved away. So it's not, I don't have any family and business there and I don't have any connections there with anyone. Um, I do think, again, I'll, I'll, I won't go through in, in the interest of time, I won't go through and reiterate everything I said last time, but I think this community has worked very diligently to have this work. It's a very unusual, it's a very unique opportunity for them, but it's a very unique area because of this trail. 
um, that is spectacular. And I hope at some point everybody on the commission would have an opportunity to go and view this trail because it connects the two trails to where they, you make the loop. And um, it is, absolutely, I've done it and it's absolutely spectacular. But I just want you to know I'm gonna, I stand by everything I said last time. And I hope that the commission will give them the opportunity to give it another try. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here's the uh, queue order now. Commissioner Adams, Bracky, and Vasquez. I'd just like to say thank you for, uh, you know, for making the changes. And uh, I, I can tell that you've taken it, all, all the comments and the feedback to heart. Uh, it seems I've learned something about your idyllic uh, community. And uh, now that we've, uh, I guess you have my support and I'm gonna be looking forward to coming up and maybe taking a visit on one of those vehicles myself. I'm, I'm not real good on anything that, uh, you know, it, I don't do two wheelers. I might be able to do one of these. So, so I, would, I would like to try, but I wanted to thank you for, for making the changes. And it certainly seems like it meets all the concerns and, and uh, things that were troublesome to me. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brackey. Great, thank you. Um, I just um, also want to echo those um, thanks and appreciation for the responsiveness to all of the questions and concerns that were raised last time. I really appreciated all of the thought that went into um, bringing forward the updated information to us and addressing the, the concerns that were raised by the Sheriff's Office. I thought that was great. The information that was in our packet was helpful today and to see the uh, revised resolution that is being proposed for us tomorrow is, is very helpful because it integrates all of those key messages around safety and the um, changes to the speed limit and the um, monitoring the annual approach. I, it just seems like it was very uh, responsive to the concerns that were raised and so look forward to um, supporting this tomorrow. Thank you very much. I have Commissioner Vasquez and then Commissioner Stanton. Yeah, I want to thank Zane and Mike and uh, by extension Commissioner Hurd for letting me be a gadfly and um, addressing the concerns that I sent in in writing as well as comments I made at the meeting last month. Uh, there is one element that I was hoping to see changed that wasn't and I'd like to understand why. And that is, I had proposed that you bring this back to two year pilot rather than three. You've had two years of experience. You are proposing to increase patrolling and uh, reducing the speed limit and the other uh, aspects of addressing safety, increasing fines. That's all really positive. Um, but I would really like you to consider dialing this back to two years rather than three, giving the commission the opportunity to review what has occurred in those two years um, and uh, see where we go from there. I also appreciate the uh, final whereas in the resolution that we're not uh, giving any kind of blanket approval for OHV use on state highways anywhere else. I'm not sure how legally binding that is. It certainly states intention. But let's, let's focus on the three year versus two year, if you don't mind, Commissioner Hurd, and uh, uh, walk me through why two years would be onerous for you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, Commissioner Vasquez. Uh, we've looked at this a, a lot and we feel like to, for some of the business community and a lot of our citizens that count on this, we feel like that this program for three years, we're going to be, it can easily be adjusted at the end of one year or even during the year. We feel like the program going for the three with the investments necessary on some of these rental machines and different things, we wanted at least a little more time out there, more or less a sure thing, not necessarily unless it works well and is safe. We feel like that to ask our small business community to invest in these things and then have another if in two years 
I know a year doesn't sound like it is a lot when you're spending a lot of money on, on these investments and there is that possibility, but they understand that possibility is still there every year, depending on the safety of the program. So we feel like that that deterrent to, you know, uh, this, this program to where we could actually uh, have a loss of it in, in even one year, we just feel like that the commission will hear about any negatives through the CDOT folks, Zane and them, and, and we can do this program in different ways, add to it in those one year reporting cycles. And we feel like it's important that we don't just say two years is, is it, and then we renegotiate everything about it is, is just a move that we felt we didn't wanna take uh, at the city or the county level for our for our community at this time, then you know I know that may not answer every question, but that that was a lot of it. We feel like we already are under a lot of uh, uh, reporting, and that's great. And we'll do that every year, and even a month to month report on accidents. And uh, I think the three years is, is just a, a better approach for us in this community to let this thing work through in a safe and, and, and good way. Well, That's sure part of your feeling of exhaustion, uh, but yep. you've just answered the question, you know, this is not a guarantee if uh, the OHV uh, permission was uh, rescinded anywhere along the loop, uh, city, county, or uh, public land, uh, or there was a safety concern, uh, it could be rescinded. So. Uh, yes. Again, the two versus three years really isn't changing the risk calculation, I don't think, for your small uh, business investment. Um, but I will leave it to others to comment. It's something I would have liked to see in this to give the commission uh, uh, a serious review in two years without exhausting you in, in uh, renegotiating it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the courtesy. Thank you, um, Commissioner Stanton. Thanks, Chair Stewart. I want to uh, support uh, Commissioner Hall, and I appreciated Zane Zamanachek and Commissioner Hurd's efforts to change everything and try to tighten things up. It was really well done. I think um, from my standpoint, there is one risk factor uh, weak link, and that is uh, on the state highway, you said you went from 35 miles an hour down to 30 which is an improvement, um, take the worst case, take an under 18 or a young person who may get out there and isn't gonna do 30 miles an hour and then rolls a vehicle or something like that. And I would just simply, uh, you know, I don't wanna be looking from our area at your area. I think you know it the best, but I, I really think that could be the problem area. And I know you're trying to do everything you can, but anything to, get those young riders, especially to uh, be safer and with helmets is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, are there others? Um, I'd, I'd like to weigh in with a question for the Transportation Commission. I was trying to find this in my, in my packet, but um, I've been reminded that there was a property owner um, in the summary uh, that would like to know if the commission would consider extending the distance 0.2 miles somewhere property be, could be included. And um, I, I'm, not a I'm not sure how appropriate it would be to, um, to, to have this suggested at this late time, but if there is someone on the commission who feels strongly about that request from the property owner, I think now would be the time uh, to, to say that. Then um, I want to weigh in on the two versus three years. And I will say that I think um, given the circumstances that we've had with the pandemic and some of the um, disruptions to tourism and, and disruption to travel that um, it seems appropriate to have it for three years um, instead of two, simply because this is a, an unusual time and it, the first year that this is in place as an extension 
may not have an adequate um, analysis simply because uh, it, it's a different time. And if we wait until we go back to when things are more normal, you'll probably get a much better analysis. That's my point of view on that one. So back to the question I asked, if there's anyone who saw in this communications information that we got uh, from a specific property owner who wants us extended a little bit farther than our proposal is, um, now's the time to weigh in on that. Um, if there is nobody, we will um, just move on. I would comment just that it seemed like a reasonable request and I understand it, but at the, but at the same time, um, I have not traveled that trail or that area enough to know. So Mr. Hurd, what do you think? You know, we considered that seriously and uh, we feel that it would be a great addition. It was just the struggles to get this as it exists passed with the commission. Honestly, that would be the, that was the only reason we didn't as for that extension, we had a, a request and it was, it, was, it was a struggle we felt to keep the program going. And uh, we, we were proud of the program, but as we have zero problem with the, a slight extension to help that business that I very much know who it is. And uh, they are now traveling into some of the, you know, the, the areas with the residential legally they can do that under the city and county rules to get to this business. But if they could nicely stay on the paved highway and go to this business, it would be an advantage for a lot of reasons. So uh, we have zero problems with that and could easily, if the, the CDOT folks and Zane and we could adjust those mileposts requests, but uh, that's my take on it. it. And that was, it was just wanting the program to continue was why we didn't ask for that. And, and maybe that wouldn't have threatened it, but we just didn't know. Uh, that's, that's where I'm at. So at this point in time, can that be added to the um, resolution? Is Zane maybe able to answer that? Well, and one of the things that's been important to the, to the business owners in the community is to try to keep the dust down and to keep them out of residential areas. Yeah. So uh, that's that would be the purpose of us try to keep, you know, really try to keep the dust down because the roads, the only paved is, is actually the, the main highway. The rest is all dirt roads. And that would, I mean, that's the whole purpose of trying, part of the purpose of trying to do this is to keep down the dust and to keep the riders out of the residential areas. It's my understanding, but I, I don't feel one way or the other about the extension. Well, procedurally, what would you have to do, Commissioner Hurd, in order to, is it just simply a drafting issue of the resolution that we get to approve or disapprove tomorrow? Is that all that needs to be done? Or, is, or do you have to go back to your commission for some formal vote as well? We could do an addendum to our resolution. We certainly wouldn't want to delay the vote because of this on you guys tomorrow. We... If, if we could have that as an add-on, approved add-on, whatever you guys as a commission and however uh, Zane and, and uh, those folks in Grand Junction feel like, I mean, in our case, it, it wouldn't be a problem. That would be a county piece, not a city piece, where this small addition would be that, that business is in the county versus city. But I mean, we could, that would be a mile post description change and uh, I feel like we could do it, but I, you know, if you guys are comfortable voting on it with that allowed addition and leave it in uh, Zane's hands and ourselves to make that little adjustment, uh, I'm sure the county would be able to do that fairly timely. Well, I certainly, as one commissioner, would not object to this uh, based on what Commissioner Hall's view of it. So. And, and yours, Commissioner Hurd, and, as well as Zane. So I'm comfortable with the added change uh, as one commissioner. Thank you. I'd like to have uh, Herman maybe just read what he put into the, uh, into the chat box on how that could be accomplished. 
Yeah, you bet. It should be pretty easy. We would just need Zane. We have in the resolution, there's a, there's a piece of it that says that it runs from milepost 69.85 to milepost 73.11 and then lists the intersections. We would just need to know what the new intersection and milepost is. And then that can be a, um, uh, an amendment to the resolution tomorrow. That would be pretty easy. Thanks, any further comments on this? Yes, Madam Chair, this is Bill Tebow um, with just a quick uh, question. As I was reading the resolution um, again just now, I noticed that the commission, the language is setting forth that the commission has reviewed the conditions for which a permit would be issued and notes the following conditions. And I'm wondering, based on our conversations today, and especially the amendment of the mileposts, if we might wanna say that we have reviewed and approved the following conditions, which are intended to preserve safety on the State Highway 149 corridor, to make it clear that we have discussed this, we have reviewed it, we have approved these conditions, and those are the conditions that would be part of the permit. I'm not sure if I understand these to be just minimum conditions or all conditions. Uh, the language that I had suggested would, would make them all conditions and not um, other, other things could be added. In other words, other, other conditions couldn't be added I don't know if I'm making a whole lot of sense, but um, I just think maybe the language could be tempered a little bit to clear up that we have reviewed and approved the following conditions, just to be sure that these are the totality of the conditions and that the parties aren't adding other conditions that the commission hasn't reviewed. So Bill, uh, just, just one thing to clarify, on the permit, there would be some other terms and conditions that had to do with things like um, allowing, for instance, county workforces to go erect signs and making sure that that's done in a safe way. Some kind of like more practical, I mean, these okay. are practical too, but, but some of those kinds of kind of technical terms and conditions will certainly be in the permit as well. So. Okay, I didn't kind of, realize kind of, that. Okay, I didn't realize yeah. that. And so what I have suggested wouldn't be compatible with that. So perhaps the language that's in the resolution is the better language under those circumstances. So, but I just wasn't sure uh, based on our amending the milepost, just how far we as a commission had to go to, to approve other conditions. And I guess um, if the language remains the same, then you'll have the ability to enter those uh, pro forma or template kind of conditions and get the thing rolling without us having to review it. Does that, does that make sense then what I just said? I think for the permit, it probably does. Okay. That's, that's all I'm concerned about because the, the resolve, it, it basically says that um, the terms of the permit are what we are approving. And um, I, I suppose we're approving terms that are, as I say, normal or pro forma or template kind of uh, conditions in a permit. So I'm happy with the language after thinking it through. And um, sorry for bringing it up, but it just wasn't clear to me. And I thought I'd jump in before we signed off. Thank you. Uh, you've stimulated some uh, conversation here, I think, Commissioner Tebow, because I have Commissioner Hickey, then Vasquez, then Beatty on the uh, queue. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Tebow. It, I'm sorry to be a lawyer about this, but it <laughs> strikes me all this conversation, which first I should preliminarily say, I really appreciate all the attention to this and the presentations because you have obviously really thought about the importance of all of our concerns and, and your own concerns that you of course raise locally and, and take very seriously. 
Should we say something like the commission isn't responsible for issuing the permits though? I guess sitting here, maybe somebody can speak to, do we have responsibility for safety out there because we've approved the conditions for the permit? And um, we, I believe that appropriate safety protections are in place. Um, but sitting here as a board member from afar, I guess that has to come to mind. I, I, I just want to address that. If that were the case, then anything we approved for anyone, we'd be responsible for their safety. So I, I'm not an attorney <laughs> and you are. But it does that if if we if we say that that anything that happens on any of our highways we'd be responsible for, and then when they do permitting, then they cover some of those details. But the but all that was in place. I don't understand why you felt like we'd be responsible. Well, we're probably not, and I understand that this just being such a special, unique situation where where we're approving the permit. Um, it makes me raise it, but I'm, I am, you know, from what I hear, fully in support. Well, if that were the case, then, you know, what, when we talk about putting, um, you know, we just talked about, which has been so successful, is using our state highways for people to put their restaurants. That's mm -hmm. always been a real concern of mine, because that would, to me, if we prove that, that's almost like a responsibility as well. So, Maybe I'm just overthinking that one too, because I think it's been really successful in my area, as we talked about earlier, having the restaurants and out and on some of our state highways in my area, we've, we've done a lot and I find it successful, but that always kind of concerned me too. So maybe, maybe we're just overthinking. Thank you. Uh, I have the Commissioner Vasquez, then Beattie, please. I think it'd be interesting uh, before I uh, launch into what I was going to say to hear from Kathy Young about uh, commissioner commissioner's concern about liability. I was worried that you were going to do that, Commissioner Vasquez. <laughs> you knew I was. <laughs> um, granting there's good case law granting a permit does not uh or granting you know anything a building permit any kind of permit does not um uh make the state liable for that action uh this is unique though but no i i'm going to do some more research but right now my answer is i the state has pretty um pretty stringent uh, governmental immunity. And so I need to try to decide if that somehow waives that immunity. I don't think it does, but I'm gonna do a little more research and, and I'll get an email sent out. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> and so the question I'm gonna raise next uh, adds to another layer to that uh, question of liability. Uh, and since I had been going back and forth with Zane and Mike uh, with a few of my concerns, one that hasn't been aired with the rest of you is concern about nighttime use of the highway by OHVs. Many of them don't have lights or turn signals. Um, and um, there's some language in this resolution that says that the uh, use of the highway has to meet all the uh, particular requirements uh, put forth by the county and the town. But my understanding from my feedback from Zane is that uh, there will be nighttime use. Um, and that, that causes me concern uh, and another layer of safety. And perhaps uh, Commis uh, Commissioner Hurd or, or Zane would like to respond to that. I, I guess I can speak to it for a little bit. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, the thought was that, because it was a discussion that we had, um, not recently, but prior to the last pilot program, we talked about some kind of nighttime restriction. And the thought was, you know, what that would do is it would prohibit them, for instance, if they were to uh, not knowingly plan to be out there on the highway for some portion at night, 
it would then put them in violation of 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 the uh, of the program. And so the thought was, you know, if an OHV is out on the highway that doesn't have headlights, for instance, or taillights, they could be ticketed just like any other vehicle for not having adequate lighting. Um, now, with the turn signals, it, it is legal to use hand signals for turning. And of course, that's not necessarily ideal at nighttime. Um, I, I certainly see that. Um, so that that's a bit of a concern, but I w we're not, we weren't quite sure how to get around that idea of, of requiring turn signals, um, even though it is legal to have a vehicle on the highway without functioning turn signals if you're using hand signals. And so we thought just leaving it uh, with the idea that, yeah, you could be ticketed for not having lights if you're out there without at least headlights, taillights, brake lights was, was, was the way to leave it. That was the thought at the time, though, and I don't know if there was other discussions at the county level originally or or elsewhere. Uh, you know, uh, we have talked to that Zane and, and commission. Uh, we feel like yes, uh, a any vehicle, jeep, car, pickup with no tail lights, or I mean, this would be like a motorcycle that does not have turn signals either but has the arm signals available to them to turn, but they would have to have brake and tail lights to be legal. And I would say 90% of the OHVs I've seen do have that. They do not necessarily have turn signals, but they have tail lights and brake lights. So then it's, it's a fine if they don't have the other lighting and they'll be using the arm signals to, to turn with that would, but yes, it's a, it's a ticketing offense and we will add it with our, uh, with our fine structure, you know, and make that known that that is not a legal way to go around at night uh, based on your lighting on an OHV or any other vehicle. Thanks that so was, much. Thanks so much for that clarification. I've seen a lot of OHVs out here at the North Sand Hills that uh, are, are more like sand rails and don't have uh, lights. So um, I'm pleased to hear at least that uh, if they were discovered, they would be ticketed. Uh, yes. And, and it'd be interesting to know from you know, the counts that you do, whether you have much use of the state highway section that connects the loop uh, at night. We will get those for sure. We'll have that. <coughs> Chairman? Yeah, Commissioner Beatty? Yeah, um, I would just like to voice my support for making the amendment to the mile marker to add that where the community supports it, but they were afraid to bring it forward in that they may lose the whole permit. Um, so I guess I would encourage us to add that um, or adjust that mile marker so that it kind of addresses the community concerns of residential use of these um, and it's I think it's when I heard it was just because they were afraid of losing the whole permit um, not to bring it forward was a concern to me um, I think we should work with the community to meet their needs so. thank you uh, I'll give it back to Commissioner um, Hurd if you'd like to make some comments and I think we're going to close this out here in a minute you know, uh, I hate to back up on some of this, but I needed to let you know, I've had had conversations with my fellow board members since we started this conversation. And uh, the concern we now have, and I agree with it, is we had more extensions asked of us by other businesses. Mm -hmm. And we feel like we better stay with the mile posts that we now have in here because it's unfair to our other businesses that also wanted this. And it's, it would be an extension to the North and the South and further. We just, we, we think we can make this a good program like the mile posts are now. And so I withdraw my support of that. And I appreciate the commission members that do support that, but that's where we will get into a fix uh, with, with not fairly dealing with our other public we would 
we think we need to stick with our mileposts that we currently have on the on the uh, authorization or the you know the resolution and and move forward with it that way. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. So uh, as we look at this for tomorrow, we are going to say um, that now the applicant um, on behalf of Hinsdale County doesn't want us to extend that in order to have an equitable treatment um, at this point in time of uh, the rest of the businesses who, who might be wanting to do the same thing. And so my understanding is that the resolution will remain as we saw it today, is that everyone's understanding? And if you could weigh in as well, um, Herman, just to make sure that's accurate. Yeah, so, so what I've heard, I think at the request of the applicant, uh, we wouldn't be changing the resolution for tomorrow. Yes, yes. I mean, that, that, that's the county's take. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Uh, thanks for taking the time to be with us. And uh, this will come into consideration tomorrow during our formal Transportation Commission meeting. Um, I think that we've uh, concluded this item and as people are starting to leave us, um, I'd like to turn this over now to the next and last agenda item, which is the policy directive 1601. And Aaron Willis is our um, presenter on that one. Thanks for being patient with us, Aaron. And we appreciate you letting us uh, move you to the end. Absolutely, not a, not a problem, Chair Stewart. Um, what you have before you commissioners, and I can of course uh, try and be brief if um, that's acceptable, is uh, a memo and the final uh, draft uh, 1601 policy re revised version. And I can just speak briefly um, on the, the key revisions um, to the policy directive, um, which uh, staff is seeking your approval on. Um, and then I can simply take, uh, take some questions. So. Um, as was uh, stated when we talked about this uh, last in January, um, the 1601 um, policy directive has been updated. Um, there have been um, some minor administrative and, and clerical changes. Um, and in addition to that, we've added uh, in a section that includes a transportation demand management strategy requirement um, for our new interchanges on interstate uh, in the state highway system, um, our uh, interchange uh, and interchange modifications under certain circumstances. Um, and so the policy also outlines a bit of background on the um, on, on why TDM and how TDM uh, strategies um, can help to um, reduce VMT congestion and subsequent uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and then the policy uh, also talks about um, the goals that are intended, um, the, the traffic reduction goals that are intended um, from the implementation of these TDM strategies. Um, and lastly, um, the policy also states um, that the, uh, the recommended um, TDM strategies, which are a menu of TDM uh, strategies are shown here on, this, on the screen, um, that those will be eventually um, wrapped up and, and, and included in the final IGA um, uh, and also included in the systems level study, which uh, gets approved by the commission. Um, and so what's being shown um, on the screen, um, this uh, is the TDM strategy scorecard. This document actually doesn't, is not included in the policy directive. If it's actually included in the procedural um, directive. And um, just a, a, again, a bit of background um, or refresher for, for commissioners. Uh, commission takes action and approves the policy directive, which has been included in the in the commission packet and the executive director 
um, approves the procedural directive, and that is the step-by-step uh, -step, um, instructions that applicants follow um, in order to uh, get the necessary approvals for a new interchange on the state highway system and also applies to interchange modification. Um, so with that, I will, um, I will simply uh, ask if there are any questions on the, um, on the revised policy. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, if there are questions, please put your name in the chat and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, I'll start the uh, comments, I think, if that's all right. I've read this document a number of times and I, I, I still have a little bit of um, concern about one part of it. I want to start my comments with saying I think this is significant and important uh, policy change for 1601, and I think the intent of it is a good one. I do have an issue with the idea of mobility hubs being part of the um, procedural piece in that um, we at CDOT are working on mobility hubs now in various locations on I-25 and other places. And I uh, do want to say that um, when we provide mobility hubs in one, in one uh, location using CDOT monies, um, but not in other locations, and then asking uh, people who want to get into the system to do the provision of a mobility hub, it just seems inequitable to me. And so that's my big issue on um, putting mobility hubs in here as a required uh, TDM. Although I understand that it's a pick and choose sort of a thing and you get 80 points for mobility hub, but if you can't do that, you could garner points doing other things. Um, a conversation that I have been having um, with others that do TDM, um, you know, we look at TDM as behavior change. And um, when this on 4B says, uh, as a background, TDM helps traveling public, public by offering access to multiple transportation modes through strategies. Um, strategies in my mind are behaviors and uh, mobility hubs and providing uh, transit are different than encouraging transit and integrating with mobility hubs mm -hmm. uh, because those are capital investments. And so um, that's, that's a piece that's a little bothersome to me in the way this is written. Um, I, I also feel very strongly that under the procedural piece, we should have some input on that as well, even though that's not part of this policy change. Mm -hmm. I'd like us to have the ability to um, weigh in um, on that procedural piece when mm -hmm. it's appropriate to do that. Mm -hmm. um, other than that very well thought out document, I don't want to hold this up by um, belaboring the point that, that I think the mobility hub piece is um, a very weird piece simply mm -hmm. because we are doing mobility hubs. We are providing mobility hubs. But if you happen to be a developer that doesn't get one of the mobility hubs, you know, if they, if we don't, if your development doesn't have access to a mobility hub that we've designated, um, then the cost is, could be fairly phenomenal. Some of these small mobility hubs at $5 million are, are not the kinds of mobility hubs that probably will be necessary for um, a new development adjacent to a, a highway. Mm -hmm. I suspect those are more in the realm of $20 million, which is sort of what the one at Highway 7 and I-25 has been sort of designated as to probable cost. Um, so those are my comments on this one. And it looks like I've got people in the chat box. So um, it looks like, um, oh, it looks like Commissioner Hickey is leaving to get a, a vaccine appointment day. And uh, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's all that's in the chat box right now. 
Um, other comments, uh, anybody have any input on this? It comes in front of us tomorrow for approval. Madam Chair, Bill Tebow, um, I'm not sure if I'm still on. Um, yes, you are. I'm, oh, good. <laughs> I'm wondering if um, the concerns that you have are addressed in another part of the um, directive where we define type one, type two, and type 2A um, actions. Uh, in other words, type one actions, as I understand it, have to come to the commission for approval, or I think the word in the, in the directive is um, uh, action. Um, and then on a type 2A, or I'm sorry, on a type two, uh, the chief engineer sort of makes the decision on the action, but the, uh, the applicant can appeal that to the commission. Correct. And I'm just wondering if, um, if interjecting the commission into things that you're concerned about might help alleviate some of those concerns in that the commission would ultimately have to take you know, the final action. And one of the things that I was thinking about in the type two is that um, even though the applicant can appeal, perhaps there's a way to, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the definition of an applicant is. I didn't see it here, but I'm just wondering if um, maybe that can be expanded a little bit to allow those that might be impacted to have the ability to appeal or to get it to the commission under certain circumstances. In other words, I'm, I'm just suggesting that any, any decision-making that's made by um, either um, the chief engineer or however it is um, dealt with procedurally can be reviewed by the commission. Um, but I'm not sure that's enough for you, uh, and I'm not sure it's enough for me, I'm just raising it because um, perhaps it, it could be, I, I just don't know. Can I? Yeah, so a, a couple of, of things that might, that, that could be a potential answer. The applicant, um, which is defined as a local government or quasi government um, organization, so, um, because contractually, um, and just minorly to your point, Commissioner Tebow, um, CDOT doesn't enter into these IGAs with um, like private entities. We, we, we do these with other government and quasi-governmental organizations. Um, but the commission does, the commission action uh, as uh, stated in the procedural directive is actually approval of the systems level study. And so what we've um, stated here is that when the applicant goes through the process and they've picked, you know, the, the, the TDM strategies that, that best work for them, then they also include those strategies in the systems level study. And so that is what gets presented to commission for action. So ideally, Commission will see if an applicant has proposed a mobility hub for their for their project, um, and they'll be able to provide uh, input at that point during which they you all would be um, approving or disapproving the um, the the systems level study. Um, the other point um, to your to uh, the other uh, comment I had um, to your point, Commissioner um, Chair Stewart was. We did include in the strategies a, a reference to a, a document that um, the Division of Transit and Rail is preparing, and it is a mobility hub guidance document. And listening in on the conversation earlier today and, and sort of having uh, the desire to, to sort of workshop the various ranges of, of mobility hubs of, uh, are available. Um, I, I believe uh, that DT, uh, DTR, Division of Transit and Rail, is developing sort of that guidance. And so we simply just reference that guidance because we want to make sure that this policy is also consistent with that guidance and that, um, you know, the, the appropriate type of 
mobility hub is being proposed um, uh, with a with a new interchange. Um, so I don't I don't know if that answers exactly um, your concern, um, but um, that's that, that that was my thought. Thanks, Aaron, for that. You know. I think there's a level of comfort in that. My issue had, I was looking at a very large picture, I think, and wondering if it would be um, so onerous financially um, for a jurisdiction working with a developer to do a mobility hub and therefore not getting that 80 points. Mm -hmm. um, whereas some get it for nothing, not for nothing, but mm -hmm. you know, we're, providing those opportunities along the corridor. So um, I thank you for that. I'll have to think about this a little bit, but I, I, I appreciate you listening to my concerns about this um, and, and the difference that I feel between TDM strategies, which are behavior changes and capital improvements, which uh, support TDM strategies, but mm -hmm. I don't see those as TDM strategies. I see them as TDM investments, just maybe semantics. Um, okay. I know people are falling off this call, but I wanted to give Commissioner Beatty a chance to um, talk. Yeah, just uh, I think you've kind of taken care of my concerns for the rural areas and the TDM pieces, but um, just an example, I think of is in Lyman, you have Highway 24 and I-70 interchange. There's truck stop and development starting to move north. Eventually, they may need to widen that interchange. Is that something that would have to come through that sort of a process or just widening a, an overpass and interchange? Is that just something that would continue to just, just take place as the need arises? Mm -hmm. I guess it, I was kind of wondering on clarification, does that fall into a 2A uh, classification or does it even fall into this if it's just uh, improvement to that uh, interstate and state highway interchange? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good question. Good question, uh, Commissioner Beatty. Um, the, the threshold for between that 2A, those minor modifications and a type two is the need for a, a systems level steady. Um, and so we've included um, that in, we included those, those elements um, that, that uh, the elements that are required to compose or develop a systems level steady. Um, and so really, I think that is probably a conversation um, with, the, with the RTD and, and, and the engineers um, covering region four, but um, I think if if things are very minor and there isn't a this significant change in traffic or safety, um, you're probably and I'm 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 absolutely you know I'm just giving you my my guess just based on the description that you provided. You're probably in the two A minor um, the two A minor interchange category, um, but you know you'd have to actually sit down with with uh, with the CDOT staff and in Region Four to to you know really make that full determination. Okay. I guess the other one that falls in that is probably that going to be having the large volume of increases would be like at at Bennett, where you have State Highway seventy nine and the overpass and rapid development, and that when you start getting queues almost backing up onto the interstate at times. Is that something that would be like a level two or a type? I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to figure out what kind of interchanges that are existing mm -hmm. would fall into having to do these TDMs in communities and things that are connecting two state highways plus a, a county or, or city street. So it's just, I'm trying to figure out in my mind how all this plays together on things that I could see be needed in in the future, so. Yeah, I, I, I can totally understand that that conversation. It is probably worth sitting down and looking at each one of these individual um, pro projects to, to sort of get a, a preliminary determination on what level they would hit, sitting down with yourself and, and, and the region um, to sort of to see where they are and what they think are type twos and type two A's. 
Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Erin, for your work on this. Uh, is there any final comment, any final question before we uh, let Erin and the rest of CDOT go until early tomorrow morning? All right. I don't see any. Thank you for hanging in there, everyone, and we'll see you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thanks very much. Thank you.